Hello everybody. Uh, welcome to High View Geometric Design, which is a part of your subject CE532. So I am Jeevan Amir Gage. I am a design engineer working in Road Development Authority. So from here onwards, we will be looking at how to do highway geometric design or how to design highways with theories and with practicals using the software called Civil 3D. So in my first part of the lectures, I will describe you how to do geometric design using highway engineering theories. So this is our outline. So I will give you a basic introduction. Then I will give you the basic design criteria how to design a road. What are the things we need to consider when designing roads? That is basic design criteria. Then we will be looking at the uh, cross section of a road. So before designing or before doing anything related to highway, we need to know what are the things we have in a road. So under the cross section of a road, we will learn in that. Today we will learn these things. So within this lecture, we will then these three parts introduction basic design criteria and cross section of road but under this course we will be looking further into side distance of roads horizontal alignment super elevation vertical alignment and finally horizontal and vertical coordination so we will, this will be taught to you as a part of theories after that I will be uh, doing these things in a software called Civil 3D, how to design roads using that Civil 3D software. So then I will move on to the introduction of my course. So geometric design is an integral part of highway engineering. So if you are doing highway engineering, geometric design is very important. You need to know how to do geometric design or otherwise how to design roads so it is concerned with the positioning of physical elements according to standards and constraints so I will describe it more in the next slide but before that the basic objective of geometric design is to optimize efficiency and safety while minimizing the cost and environmental damage basically in doing geometric designs, you have to have an optimized design so that it will give you efficient road or otherwise a good user-friendly or driver-friendly road while maintaining safety aspects as well as minimized cost and minimum damage to the environment. So, what are the elements? We talk in the previous slide. I told you we are concerned with positioning physical elements. So, what are these physical elements? There are three physical elements that is horizontal alignment, vertical alignment, and cross section. Horizontal alignment is the one we see from a plan view. That means if you see a road on a plan view so if you think of a way you see a road on a google map or uh, google earth you will see the road something like this so you can't see any elevations here just a plan you can see the straight portion then you can see the curved portion so you only see the plan view of the road no elevations that is called the horizontal alignment. Then vertical alignment means the elevation beam of a road. So if you consider this road, you can see this is coming to a top elevation from the bottom elevation. So we call it vertical alignment. Then you have the cross section. Cross section as you know is the width component of the road. Here if you consider you have the travel lane where your, your vehicles are expected to travel and there are some other notations which I will be 
teaching you in later slides. So the combination of three will give you a nice looking road to you. So you have to arrange these physical elements in such a way that we get a good efficient road but we have to ensure that your construction cost of that road is minimum minimum is when, when I am saying minimum you have to ensure that the quality is there you can have a road with minimum cost but the quality may not be there so when I say minimum cost you have to ensure that it is a good quality road and you have to minimize the environmental impacts too because if you have so many environmental impacts even though you create or you construct a good road there will, there, will, there will be some adverse effect to the environment due to your road so if you are a good designer if you are a good design engineer also constructing a road in a proper manner you will be minimizing the damages to the road minimizing damages to the environment that is the best way to do good designs then to do a good design you have to have design standards because when I say horizontal alignment in the previous slide when I say horizontal alignment you need to know what are the curve radius you have to select for the curve what kind of straight lens you can adopt how much of length you have to select to design the road then you have the vertical alignment constraint that means what kind of gradient or what kind of slope you have to use for your road so you can if you see here you have a slope here on the road so what are the maximum slopes what are the minimum slopes what kind of slopes you have to ignore what kind of slope you have to select so they have to be decided by someone otherwise you cannot design a road as you think there are standards for that so when you come to the cross section what are the lane needs what is this we are calling this shoulder we have a drain scheme so what are the type of drains we have to use what are the lane needs what is the curve radius all those things has to be known by someone to design a road so to get a good or the best practice for best design roads, there are several guidelines in the world designed to uh, create or design roads. So we call them design standards. If you do structural design or concrete design, you have BA standards, American standards. Likewise, for road design, you have separate design standards. It will tell you what kind of road you have to design, what, what are the road widths, what are the curve radiuses. Then the most important thing when you are designing a road, you have to ensure, you have to think of what is the speed of the road, what is the maximum speed of the road. So when you are using that maximum speed, what is the minimum radius you have to adopt for curves, those things are illustrated in design standards so they are developed by engineering professionals so it will they, they are designed considering the requirement of road users as well as other stakeholders so adopting these uh, standards people can or the design engineers can design roads in proper manner so these standards will be uh, changed or will be uh, used in several ways. That means in one country they use one standard, in another country it will use another standard. So for example, in Sri Lanka what we are using is RDA road design guideline. If you go to USA or United States of America, they have ASTRO design guidelines. But 
inside America, there are several states, New York, uh, Washington, likewise. So those states have several guidelines for road design. So according to the situation, they have to use various guidelines. But all these guidelines do is, but all these guidelines do is, they ensure you have an efficient road while minimizing the cost as well as the other adverse effect to the environment or other uh, road users or the other public uh, spaces or the people. Then you have some examples design standards. So in Sri Lanka we have geometric design standards of course. It is published in 1998 by Road Development Authority. Then you have Geometric Design Standards of Express Space published in 2017 by Road Development Authority. Then you have Guide to Road Design Part 3 for Geometric Design published in 2015. You call it as Offshore 2015. So it is published by Australia. So in USA they have Geometric Design of Highways and Street 2017. 2018 that is the latest publication so it is also known as aka means also known as ASHTO 2018 so that is published in USC so these guidelines are periodically, periodically updated to provide more satisfactory design because uh, the world is changing every day so we have to uh, create more uh, sustainable or more suitable design standard to the, the modern world. So these standards are uh, changed periodically or modified periodically to get satisfactory design of roads. Then we will be looking at the road functional certification. So before designing roads, we have to know what are the functions of a road. We have two basic functions of roads. That is provide mobility between centers and provide access to land and other properties. So provide mobility between center means it is giving a way to travel between two locations. So if you consider you are traveling from Colombo to Candy Yes, there are several roads, so we call it, we have a mobility, we get the mobility from, let us say, Candy Colombo Road, so you are getting the mobility from Candy Colombo Road to travel from Colombo to Candy. So then, after that, there are some other roads, that means, uh, if you want to go to some other minor location or if you want to go to your home in Candy, you have to use another small road, A1 road or the Colombo Candy road is a main road, then you have to use some other small road to go to your property or your house. So you are, that, that means you are going to access your property, you access your land through some other roads. So that Colombo Candy Road provide more mobility but the small road to your house provide more accessibility. It helps to access you but the main road provides more chance to mobilize. That means it has more speed. So if you consider this chart you can see express has have more mobility but less accessibility. That means you can't stop everywhere at the expressway. You can't stop only after going from an interchange. So you have less access, less access but more mobility. But when you come to AB class stores, that means I will tell you what are the AB class stores later in later next slide. But when the accessibility is coming high, your mobility will be getting lower. When there is more mobility, you have high speed. 
then there is low mobility you have high access so the CDE class row, roles O in other, word, other words the roles we are using to access our houses have more access but low mobility we have less speed so these are the road system in Sri Lanka which I talked earlier in the slide so class E roads means the expressways you know if you go to google map you will see E1, E2, E3 likewise for expressways so E class road means expressways which we have high uh, mobility and fully access controlled roads so you cannot uh, access the expressway from everywhere you can access the expressway from a particular location called interchange so we call it fully access control when you go to a class roads still there is high mobility most of the time but there are less it is less compared to expressways mobility is less compared to expressways but accessibility is high so going down you will see uh, the mobility decreases but the accessibility increases so a class road they are mainly the roads uh, within two provinces a class roads are the roads within two provinces then b class roads are the roads within a province major roads within a province and AB and AC class roads are major roads but in shorter lengths so they, they are within a province but they have high importance so that is why I call them AB or AC so B class roads they are within a province uh, especially this E, A, A, B, A, C and B class roads are governed or maintained by the road development authority and then the c class roads are maintained by the road provincial road development authority or we call them erda then b and e class roads are the small roads we, where we use to access our homes or villages so the accessibility will be increasing downwards but mobility will also decrease downwards going upwards you will see mobility increases and the accessibility decreases then we will look at the basic design criteria what is the design criteria we have to adopt when we are designing a road so there are several criteria we have to adopt so I have listed out some of these. I will explain this one by one in here. So functional classification, I told you what type of road we are designing, what is the mobility, what is the accessibility, whether we are giving more mobility or more accessibility, that is called the functional classification and the level of access control, how much you are allowing to access that road how much you are allowing to uh, some, how much you will limit so if you consider an expressway we are not allowing the bicycles or three wheelers to access that road so we are keeping some kind of access control for smaller vehicles in an expressway so that is what, what you mean by functional classification and level of access control then you have the topography land use and physical features so these criteria also should be considered when designing roads so topography means what kind of land what kind of area you have i will be discussing in detail in a later slide under vertical alignment but in general i can tell you Topography means whether you have a flat land or a mountainous land or kind of a mountainous and flat combination land in that area where you design the road that is mean by the topography. Then land use means what kind of use in the land in that area. So if it is an urban area you have 
high land use you have buildings, schools, offices, industrial zones likewise to have a high land use. If it is a rural area, the land use is very low. You have small houses here and there. The congestion is very small, so the land use means whether it is urban area or a rural area or suburban area likewise. On the other hand, the physical features are there may be reverse historical locations, buildings, trees, so you have they will affect the design of your road. So also we call them constraints, which will affect your design if there is a so let you assume that you are constructing your so you are designing a road in a new area. If you are supposed to design a road in a new area, if there is a temple in the road trace, when you are designing, if you have a temple in the road trace, road trace, you cannot demolish the temple. You have to redesign the road so that the temple is not affected. So we call them constraints when you are designing. So you have to address those constraints while you are designing. So those are the topography, land use and physical features uh, we encounter in road design. Then you have traffic volume, capacity and composition. So traffic volume means how much of traffic you have. That may be traffic volume per hour or traffic volume per day, traffic volume per some period of time. So you can measure how much of traffic in that road. When you are designing the road, you have to measure that volume and then you have to forecast the traffic for a future uh, period. That means from the day you from the from today to 20 years ahead or 15 years ahead, what kind of traffic might, might be there. Likewise, you have to uh, design the traffic volume when you are designing the road. So then what is the capacity of that road? So how much vehicles that can be accommodated in the road section? So if it is a smaller road, if there are so many vehicles coming, the capacity of the road is small, so your road will be getting congested. So likewise, you have to think of the capacity of your road. So depending on the capacity of your road, you have to accommodate one lane, two lane, three lane, four lane, likewise, how many lanes you have to use. Then the composition of your traffic. Composition means what kind of vehicles you have in your road. If you have so many cars, or if you have so many lorries, or if you have so many trucks, if you have your so many uh, three wheelers or bicycles, you have to design or you have to consider that fact in the design. So what kind of uh, vehicles, what is the composition of the vehicle, how many percentage of trucks, how many percentage of cars will be going in this road. Depending on that, your road cross section may be uh, very, very, your design speed of the road may be very, so these things you have to consider. Then more importantly, the safety considerations. So, it is an integral or essential part of road design. You have to ensure that you provide enough safety consideration while designing the road. So, when you are designing a road, you have to use proper radius for curves. It, it, it depends on the design speed of the road. So, we will be discussing them. Then you have to uh, provide uh, guard trails if you have sharp curves and steep slopes. So you have to provide guard trails which will uh, prevent the vehicles from falling down to the steep slopes. Then you have to use proper sign boards on roads. You have to use proper lane marking and if there are so many bicycles going on that road you have, can have a separate bicycle lane so the bicycle users are uh, getting more safe driving. Then the geometric, 
sociological climatic and drainage consideration so in that area of you where you design the road there may be uh, landslides or there may be slope stability issues or there may be flooding there may be marshy lands or there may be settlements on the ground so we have to consider these things when we are designing the road and we have to address those issues or address those constraints before it will uh, be a more uh, hazardous problem to your road so we have to uh, consider those things also when designing the roads and the other one environmental consideration so we have to minimize the damage to the environment when you are designing the road so let's for example uh, to design or to construct a road once you design the road when you are constructing it after designing when you are constructing it if you are cutting a mountain it will be a huge environmental impact cutting mountains means it will uh, affect the uh, trees or the fauna flora the animals or natural habitats in that area it will affect then it will affect the ground water table if you can remember this uh, there was a certain issue on the uh, Uber province depend uh, regarding a tunnel so there was uh, water issues for the people so you have to consider these things so if you have so many uh, mountains and you have so many rock cuttings so many cut sections in the mountains sometimes you can accommodate tunnels in that area to minimize the uh, cuttings of the mountains but in the meantime you have to ensure that the people will be less affected by the tunnels and also you have to consider about the uh, wildlife or the animals or the species in that area so you have to uh, minimize the damages for them also then one of the most important things economy and financial considerations so whatever you do you have to do it economically and you have to do it within the within a minimum cost as well as with, within the best uh, standards so you have to you can design a road with best standards the best possible way but if it is taking so much of money that is not a good design you can design a road with minimum cost you can construct the road with minimum cost but the quality is not there so that is not a good design so you have to balance the economy and the safety and the comfort of the road within economy and financial consideration finally but even though it is final, that is one of the most important things design speed, design life and design vehicle so design speed is what is the speed we are allowing in that road actually there are two things we have to consider sometimes we, we are allowing the road allowing the road users to use the design speed or we are uh, not allowing the road users to use the design speed that is something like this let us say we are designing a road with a speed of 80 kilometers per hour that means in that road the drivers can go at 80 kilometers per hour without any problem but when you are doing the sign boards or by government regulations we will tell you can't go beyond 70 kilometers per hour that is for the safety that we are designing the road for 80 kilometers per hour but we are allowing only 70 kilometers per hour the additional 10 kilometers per hour is for 
safety. So that is for the design speed of the road. What is the speed? What is the maximum speed you are designing the road? So this design speed affects the radius of the road. Horizontal, we call it horizontal alignment, which we will be, we will be learning later. So it affects the horizontal alignment as well as the vertical alignment. So design speed is what is the maximum speed you are allowing in that road. Design life, that means how much of the, the road, how much is how how much is the life of the road before doing any rehabilitation or before doing a modification to the road? What is the design life? That means after the design life you have to re-modify your road. That means you have to you may have to increase the road with you may have to do a new layer on the road or we call it overlay. That kind of thing may be there, but Within the design life, you have your road should be uh, provide it. Should, the road should provide its uh, safety and comfort driving to the road users within that time period. Then, one of the most important thing, design vehicle. Design vehicle is the vehicle that is supposed to. Uh, that the design vehicle is the vehicle, the largest vehicle that is frequently running on that road. So, this design vehicle affects the curve radius of the road. So, if you have a very large vehicle, you should have larger curves, otherwise, these vehicles cannot be turned in that road. So, but when you are selecting the design vehicle, you have to Select a vehicle that is frequently running on the road. Let us say you have. Uh, I will move on to the next slide to show you the design vehicles. These are the design vehicles that we use for RDA. So you have this single unit truck. You have, you have the dimensions here. Single unit truck, we call it SU. So its overall width is 2.6 meters and it has a turning radius of 12.8 meters. So when, if this truck is very oftenly running on a road, so you have to that if, if that is the if that this truck is the maximum uh, length vehicle in that road, you have to design the road using to cater single unit truck or you have to assume that this truck is going, uh, this truck is frequently going on that road. But if you are going to design the same road for this combo truck, which is rarely going in that road, let us say only once a year, this road truck is going on that road. So you don't have to design a road for a combo truck which rarely runs on that road. You have to uh, design the road for a design vehicle that is frequently running on that road, but that frequently running vehicle should be a larger vehicle. Otherwise, there is no point. So, if you say if there are so many cars in that road, you cannot design for cars, but you need to design a larger vehicle such as single unit truck, SU truck, or Combo truck intermediate semi trailer WB12 likewise. So these are the dimensions of design vehicles. So the design speed, design life, and design vehicle are very important part in basic design criteria. So these are the main things we have to consider when you doing geometric design. Then I will move on to the cross section of the road. That is the last part we are discussing in this session. So, what is the cross section of the road? Uh, these main elements of cross section of the road is extracted from the RDA design guidelines. Since we are living in Sri Lanka, we are uh, considering we have to consider about the local roads. So, these 
definitions are extracted from the RT design guidelines which I told you earlier the guideline we used for local road design so these definitions are taken from this so the values given in this topics in the later slides are extracted from RDA design guidelines first the term carriageway it is the area where vehicles are expected to run so if you see this image you have two yellow marks so the length between the sorry the width between these two yellow marks or the lane edges are called the carriageway so this is where your vehicles are expected to run so in sri lanka we are calling the desirable lane with this 3.7 meters uh, but it's kind of a larger value we have to normally we are using just then that maybe 3.5 3.6 likewise and if you are using a minimum value for the road width the absolute minimum should be 3.1 meter to use lane marking at least your road should be should have a width of 3.1 meter so your design vehicle width would be 2.1 to 2.6 meter so that means if you have 3.1 meter width of the road your design vehicle may be enough to travel in that road you can see here you have the width, overall width of the vehicle 2.1 to 2.6 then we will move on to shoulder shoulder is the paved area paved means you have asphalt here this black color material we call it asphalt so after the lane you have some extra width of extra width asphalt here we call it shoulder it will use to it will be used to it will be used as the, uh, to give a lateral support to the pavement this carriage it will give this will part will give you a lateral support without going out so one function is to give lateral support the other function is to use as an emergency maneuvering or parking if a vehicle is break down in this area the vehicle can be uh, parked in this area so that is why we are using a shoulder so the desirable shoulder with this 3 meter and minimum shoulder with this 2.4 and the absolute minimum shoulder with this 1.8 but locally we are not uh, practicing these values since these are to high values so if you adopt these values your road width will be very high so the adjacent land have to be acquired to consider, construct that kind of road usually if, this, if they are not express space if they are not ex, if they are not express space we are not using these kind of values usually we are using 1.5 or 1 meter 0.5 likewise for shoulder width you can see there are another uh, soil area or a gravel area after the paved shoulder. This is the paved shoulder. Then after you have some gravel area that is called the soft shoulder or verge. So this one we usually call it paved shoulder or in Sri Lanka we call it hard shoulder. This gravel part you call it soft shoulder. Then we will be moving on to the drains. So adjacent to the road, you have drains to uh, drain off the water collected into the uh, road. Or when in a rainy situation, you have to use rain to collect the water and drain them away from the road. So you can have earth drains. Otherwise, you can have concrete drains. There may be this kind of v-shaped drain or sometimes they may be rectangular drains so usually drain usual drain which are 0 0.6 meters 0 0.9 meters 1.2 meters that means that is for this rectangular drains 
So if you have a earth train, that is, train is formed using the uh, existing ground. So this slope would be one horizontal to four vertical. That is the earth train. If you have a earth train in the float section, uh, then you have cash trains which are used in high cutting sections. You can uh, that is the trains which we used in high cut areas so you can uh, google this thing or search in internet what are called catch trains you will see what are catch trains then you have the center medians when you have uh, more than two lane load likewise such as uh, four lane roads or six lane like multi lane roads so the road is divided into two parts by having a center median so it will avoid hazardous conditions from the opposing traffic so if you are adopting this kind of center median usually minimum width would be 1.2 meter that means this total center median width would be 1.2 meters that means 0.6 meters to one side and 0.6 meters to the other side then you have reservation for services in, a, in your road because in the road you have after the road you have uh, water boat lines, electricity lines sometimes nowadays you have uh, telephone lines, fiber optical cables so to, uh, you have to uh, have some free space just away from the road for these services so we have to have reserv reservation area for services so we call it reservation for services so if you are providing that kind of service area the minimum width should be uh, 0.6 meters then you have something called right of way that is the area which is which belongs to the road not the road edge but some area away from the road we call them the right of way so you course you might see this kind of boundary in, in the uh, after some distance from the edge of the road that is these are called RDA boundaries uh, this image you can see here these RDA boundaries that means up to this point from the center line of the road up to this point the area is uh, owned by the road development authority so the people can't do any construction or people can't do anything to the people can't uh, build any permanent structure uh, beyond towards the roadside of the uh, RDA boundary if you see this building this is inside the RDA boundary so someday this person have to demolish this area so that it will be acquired by the road development authority so this boundary will be marked on the road just after just some distance from the road so it will ensure that if there is a future widening of the road it can be done without problems to the uh, neighboring houses or uh, industrial people or business community anything they will not be affected if you are constructing their houses or business or commercial buildings away from this RDA boundary we call it the right of way so that is about the cross section of the road so in this series we have learned what is highway geometric design and introduction about that then we learn about the uh, function of the road then we learn about the basic design criteria what are the factors affecting or what are the considerations for geometric design of roads and finally we talked about the cross section of the road so then we, under the cross section of the road we learn what are the components of a road so what are the minimum values and what are the governing values those things we learn as, uh, under the cross section of the road so 
in this lecture what we have covered is those three parts so in the next lecture we will be looking at the side distance another important uh, factor in designing roads In this video, we are going to look at the side distance of roads. In the previous video, we have uh, got an introduction and we learned about the basic design criteria and the cross-section of a road. In this video, what we will be looking at is the side distance of the road. So, what is side distance? Side distance is the actual length of the road visible to a driver. So if you are driving a vehicle on a road, you can see ahead. So the length of the road ahead, which you can see, is called side distance. But when I say length of the road, it should be along the road. If it is a straight section of that road, the side distance is along that straight section. If it is a curved portion, it, the length should be measured along that curve. So the side distance is the actual length of road visible to a driver. So why do we need side distance? There are three occasions, but there are many occasions. Mainly I have listed out three occasions. So, we need side distance to stop a vehicle when approaching an obstacle. So, if you are driving, if you see some objectives on the road, so you have to stop the vehicle before hitting that object. So, we call it stopping a vehicle when approaching an obstacle. Likewise, at the overtaking uh, scenario, if you are going to overtake a vehicle, you need to see the road ahead so that it is clear to overtake safely and again we need side distance when we are coming to an intersection or a junction whether to put your vehicle into the junction or stay until the junction is clear so these are some scenarios we need side distance so here we have some majors where side distance is important or constraint so in the top left image you can see the side distance is somewhat blocked by this wall in the second image you can see the side distance can be blocked by the gradient of this road this if this, if this vehicle is going further forward this vehicle cannot be seen to this place so the grade of the road affects the uh, side distance. Here, this is a nighttime situation. Uh, whether if the road is, even though this road is straight, you can see the road until the headlight goes up to some distance. That is, the, we call it the headlight distance. You can see the road ahead up to the headlight. Uh, this will happen if there is no road lighting. Then in this fourth image, you can see the side distance is blocked by this bridge, this overhead bridge. So you can see the vehicle here, but if it is too far from this bridge, you cannot see it because of the bridge. So these are the things where you. Uh, come across the side distance criteria. So in this image you can see how side distance is important. If this is a curve, you call this a crest curve on a road. The curve is like this, you call it, you call it a crest curve. So a driver is coming from this side, then he has a, a some object here on the other side of the road. So this is the line of sight you can see. So along the road, we call the distance, side distance. So to measure this side distance, you have to calculate 
the side distance. So what are the factors affecting the side distance? By seeing this, this top image, you can see the driver height, eye height affect the side distance because if this is a car, the car driver sees less area because he is at a fairly lower elevation in the car. If this is a lorry or a bus or such, such as a truck or a container, the driver is at a high position. He can see much of the length ahead because his eye is at a high position. On the other side, this object, if it is a high object, the driver will see it early. If it is a very small object, the driver will see it lately because this object cannot be seen within this line of sight. In the bottom image, same thing happens. Here you have an overhead bridge. So the line of sight will be blocked by this bridge. So this overhead bridge height would affect the side distance. So if it is at a high elevation than this, the driver will clearly see this. Then if you imagine this, if this is a night time situation, the driver will see the tail light of the preceding vehicle. This driver is coming from here and another vehicle is going here. So this driver will see the tail light, the uh, dark side red light of the preceding vehicle. So the height of the tail light will affect the side distance. Because if it is at a high position, this driver will see it early. But if it is at a lower position, sometimes he may not see it. So that is the factors affecting the side distance. So here I have listed the factors which affect the side distance design. These values are taken from RBA geometric design guidelines, that means the Sri Lankan standards. Uh, but if you consider other countries like USA or Australia or England, they have their own values. Some values are similar to this one, some values are different from this one. So according to the situation, you have to select the values. But as a guide, I have used the RDA geometric design guidelines for side distance to uh, set, set out these values because we are uh, mostly working in Sri Lanka. So here one important thing it is the total reaction time. I will tell you about this in a later slide uh, but these things we have to the driver I like it affects the side distance. So if it is a passenger car, if the driver is in a passenger car, we will take the driver eye height as 1.05. If it is a commercial vehicle like a lorry or a truck, we say, uh, get the side distance as, or we select the side distance as 1.8 meter. Then the object cutoff height means the object or the uh, vehicle on the other side of the road where it is not the driver, it is the other vehicle or the object. So if it is an approaching vehicle, if it is approaching from the other side, we select the height as 1.15 meters. If it is a stationary object, that means that is not moving, it is stand still at, the, at that location. So we select the uh, object height as point. 2 meters. So the vertical ta vertical tail light or stop light, I told you earlier, it will be taken as 0 0.6 meters. Then the height of the headlight is taken as 0 0.75 meters. This upward divergence angle that should be useful for this situation, it is taken as 1 degree. Uh, and the vertical clearance, this height is taken as 4.8 to 5.2 meters depends on the road in operation if it is a local road or not 
as such as a B class road or a C class road, we take, take it as 4.8 meters. If it is an important road such as expressway or an A class road, you might take it as 5.2. So that is the criteria we encounter in side distance design. Then we will look at what are the types of side distances we come across in side distance design. There are four types. One is stopping side distance. So as the name implies, you know stopping side distance means when you are driving, you come across a object or obstacle when you when you are driving. So you apply brakes in your vehicle, then the vehicle will be going to deaccelerate and stop just before hitting the object. So the distance traveled at that time we call it stopping side distance. So in this example a car is driving and an animal is here. So this car driver detects that there is an animal so in the road so he decides he detects that there is an animal then he decides that he should break and stop the vehicle so once he is going to decide that thing you get some distance traveling until he is deciding his reaction time is that he is until he is decided, deciding that he is going to break, the vehicle travels some distance. Then he applies brake. So once he applies brake, the vehicle deaccelerates and stops just before hitting the animal. So his total distance, his total distance is called stopping side distance. Then you have the overtaking side distance. So if it is a two-lane road, if you have a vehicle going in front of you and the other side of the road you see there are no vehicles and there are dash lines on the center line so you can overtake. So you decide to overtake that vehicle. Then what we will have see what happens there. Here you can see you are on this vehicle and the other vehicle is traveling so you see there is a vehicle coming from here but you, can, you assume that you have enough distance to overtake so you come here you overtake and you come into your lane so total distance traveled in this is b1 plus b2 is called the overtaking side distance so in overtaking side distance, you will be traveling on one lane and you put your vehicle to the other lane and overtake the vehicle in front of you and you come back to your original lane. So distance travel at that time is called overtaking side distance. Then you have something called continuation side distance. It is a part of overtaking side distance. So, if you see this example, sometimes when you are going to overtake this vehicle, you put your vehicle into this position, just parallel uh, to this position. Then, you see ahead of the other lane, and you decide whether to overtake or not to overtake because depending on the uh, situation of the other lane. Let us say you are in this position, then this vehicle is somewhere here. You think before hitting this vehicle or before uh, facing an accident with this vehicle, you can overtake. So you overtake. So the distance travel in this time period is called the continuation side distance. So in continuation side distance, what the difference is, 
you are at this position, you are at the other lane and you put your vehicle to the other lane and decide whether to overtake or not. If you are going, if you overtake that vehicle, the distance is called the continuation side distance. If, if you think the side distance is not enough, so you will come back to your normal lane again without overtaking. Then the headlight side distance means the length of the headlight uh, which can be seen at the night time condition. Usually we take this headlight side distance as similar to the stopping side distance. So as we take the stopping side distance equal to the headlight side distance at the uh, headlight side distance criteria situation. Then we are going to talk about stopping side distance. The stopping side distance has two parts. I told you before when, uh, when the driver sees an object and when he, before he is going to break, he will think whether what is going to happen. So if he think he is going to hitting the object, he started to break. So when thinking he is traveling some distance in his speed. So we call it the reaction time. If I move back to this slide, in this location, the driver thinks he has to apply brake. So before pressing the brakes, he will travel some distance. So the uh, time interval between the detection of the hazard and applied braking is considered as 2.5 seconds. So we call it the reaction time. So it is taken as 2.5 seconds. But this 2.5 seconds is not for all drivers. If you are a very quick driver, it will be less than 1 second. So if you are a very old driver or a uh, non-experienced driver, you may take some time. So by research, the pe people have identified a general value which is 2.5 seconds for reaction time to cover up all the situations. Then after braking, the vehicle will be stopped. So after braking, vehicle will travel some time, some distance and stops. So there are two parts as I told you earlier, the distance travel during the reaction time before applying the brake. After applying the brake, the vehicle will travel some more distance and stop. The collection of the length in these situations are called the stopping side distance. So this is the equation for stopping side distance which is listed in RDA geometric design guidelines. This equation is same for most of the other guidelines also as to and as short. They have the same equation. Actually what RDA has done is they got the equation from those guidelines. Uh, the stopping side distance or SSD is equal to PR into V over 3.6 plus V squared over 254 mu. So, V, PR is the total reaction time which is 2.5 seconds as I told you earlier. V is the design speed which is the design speed of the road. And mu is the coefficient of longitudinal friction. Longitudinal friction means the friction along the road. Once you apply the brake, the friction will act, the friction on this surface will act on this vehicle along this line. So longitudinal friction is the friction along this road surface. The friction along the road surface, the friction along the road surface which where the vehicle is traveling because there is another friction part which will be we will be learning under horizontal alignment. So this friction 
component is applying on the uh, vehicle along the traveling direction. So we call it longitudinal friction. So TR we know that is 2.5 usually. V is the design speed. We will be following that also when we are designing a road. Mu is the one we don't know. So it is given in RDA design guidelines according to the design speed. According to design speed, uh, longitudinal friction factor uh, will be uh, changed uh, from well, so, uh, higher value to a lower value. So if the design speed is lower, friction factor is high. If the design speed is higher, friction, friction factor is low. And the friction factor or mu depends on several conditions, that is the speed of the road as we uh, see in this table and the tire condition, type of payment and the surface condition. If it is, if the tires are new, we will be having uh, good friction. If the payment or the uh, road surface, this payment means the road surface. If the road surface is a good road, good new road surface, the friction will be higher. So uh, actually, uh, not only good, but it should be a good quality pavement. So, uh, so we will be learning these things in highway construction management. So if the uh, pavement material and the material mixture is better, it will provide it will give you better friction. So, it, the uh, longitudinal friction factor will be depending on uh, type of the payment, then the surface condition, whether it is dry or wet. If the surface condition is or the road surface is wet, we will have some kind of lesser friction value. But these values are taken to address all the uh, factors to some extent. Uh, so these values have some kind of safety margin also. Then the previous equation for stopping side distance is for a flat ground. That means the uh, road is flat for that equation. But generally we come across uh, graded ground. That means the road have slopes like here. This road is coming along a slope, it is going upward. If the vehicle is going this way, it is going upward. If it is coming to the this coming to this direction, it will be coming downward. So we can modify the equation according to the grade of the road. So what will happen is we have the same equation here, and this is the uh, modification part. So instead of mu, you will be having mu plus c point zero one g. G is uh, given as a percentage. So if the road has a ten percent slope, you call it point one. Ten into point zero one, that is point. Uh, sorry, ten into point zero one. That means one here. Yeah. So likewise uh, you have to calculate the grade and check the super uh, stopping side distance. So if this G value is a positive one, you call it uphill. So if the vehicle is traveling in this direction so you have a positive grade. So if this is positive and this is already positive, this bottom one will be higher. So this part will be lower. So you will be having a lower stop inside this because if it is coming downwards, this have become a minus one because it is negative for downhill. So this becomes a lower value. These two addition will become a lower value than new so you will be having uh, high side stop inside distance um, then uh, one more thing i have to tell you 
in this equation this part represents the breaking this uh, this part represents the uh, length you traveled until you get the decision that means the length you travel and at the total reaction time and this is the length you travel at the breaking distance so this is the collection of distance to get the stopping side distance so here also you have the same this is the uh, length of the road until you get the uh, decision once you apply break you will get this length so that is about the stopping side distance then these are some general values for stopping side distance listed in RDA geometric design guidelines. If the stopping side is if the design is to this 30, you can see the stopping side distance is around 30 and continuation side distance is 60 and overtaking side distance is 160. You can see this overtaking side distance is very much greater than these two so here also if you put the this design speed value and new value into that equation you will get this value so you will get something like 29 point something so you have rounded up to 30 that is why what that is what we are getting that is why we are getting 30 as stopping side distance then you can see this for design speed of 40 you have SSD is uh, stopping side distance is 45 and continuation side distance is 90 if you see these two you can see stopping side distance is half of the continuation side distance otherwise in other words continuation side distance is equal to twice of stopping side distance so these are the uh, object values we have selected to calculate the stopping side distance and other side distance uh, actually we are not designing for overtaking side distance we are not considering overtaking side distance if we are going to consider overtaking side distance we have to put the values put these um, design values or design speed values and vehicle vehicles into a design speed or a mod, put these parameters into a model and calculate the uh, overtaking side distances but since these values are very high we are not going to adopt these values in our design it will make our design very un uneconomical instead what we do is we are doing the designs for ssd or stopping side distance or if the conditions prevail if you can have more side distance than 30 so we will be giving the uh, continuation side distance so in this stage sometimes you may not understand what we are uh, what we discuss as this uh, stopping side distance and apply into a road because um, still you don't know where you apply the stopping side distance in the road so you will be uh, learning it under uh, vertical alignment you will understand this thing very clearly at the vertical alignment section but in this section what we are discussing is what is the length of stop stopping side distance or continuation side distance at each design speed and what are the parameters affecting the design speed so as i told you earlier we are not taking overtaking side distance into account when designing roads so the application of side distance standards uh, as I told you earlier, overtaking side distance is very much greater than stopping side distance. So it is not economical to provide overtaking side distance throughout the road phase. 
if you can provide it easily you will you can provide it but you have you are not uh, you are you are not required to adhere to over 30 side distance everywhere so instead of that you can use absolute minimum side distance which is uh, stopping side distance if you have a chance to adopt continuation side distance you have to uh, use that continuation side distance in the design instead of stopping side distance without going too much into the budget here you have two questions uh, first one the side distance assumes drivers are traveling at the posted speed limit 10 miles about the speed limit or 10 kilometers about the speed limit and then the 85th percentile spot speed of the facility and the final answer is the design speed of the facility so if you discuss these four answers you can uh, you can see you will remember that all the equations are uh, related to design speed of the facility so the answer would be design speed of the facility then you have a second question in that question you have to calculate stopping side distance under three grade in the road so your road grade will be uh, flat grade og equals zero and three percent upward gradient and four percent for minus four percent or a four percent downward gradient you have to uh, do this uh, calculation by yourself i will be discussing it in a later time so that is about uh, stopping side distance and side distance so in this uh, video we have learned what is side distance and what are the constraints what are the parameters we consider in side distance what type of side distance we have and what are the equations what is the equation to calculate side distance and finally we talked about the application of side distance in road design so that is about side distance in the next section we will be looking at horizontal alignment of the road so far we have learned up to side distance section we got an introduction to road design then we learned about the basic design criteria and then the cross section of a road and finally the side distance criteria when designing roads in this section what we are going to do is look at the horizontal alignment of the road so what is horizontal alignment horizontal alignment means the plan view of the road so if you go to the sky and see the roads below you can see only straights and curves on the road so you cannot see any elevation of these roads you will only see the straight sections and curved sections so the horizontal alignment means the plan view of a road it consists of straights and curves so horizontal alignment design means we are maintaining a appropriate relationship between design speed curvature and we make another relationship between the side friction and super elevation so we will be learning these things in the coming slides so this is what happens when you go to google map you can see the plan view of a road this is a collection of roads only you can see is the straight sections and curved section of the road so this is the horizontal alignment of the road this is what we call horizontal alignment then as i told you earlier horizontal alignment consists of straights and curves but we have some additional thing here 
if tangents are called the straights, then the curves are the curves, and finally we have something called transitions. So in this image you can see this is a straight road. In the middle image you can see a curved road. So we call it a curved section of a road. This is a straight section of a road. So if you consider about the radius of a straight section, that is infinity. Then something like this a curve it might have a radius something like thousand or hundred or fifty whatever so it, it has some value for radius so when you are going to change the radius from infinity to thousand we can introduce a small curve which change the radius from infinity to thousand in this section the radius of the road changes from infinity to thousand so we call it a transition curve so we are using this transition curves in horizontal alignment design at lower speed uh, actually uh, as well as higher speeds also we are using that but the major criteria is the radius of the road if you have less radius for a road curve such as this so if you are designing for a design speed of 100 kilometers per hour if you have a thousand radius curve, you might use a transition curve. Sometimes uh, we don't need to use transition curves if this radius is high value. So that is about transition curves. Then we have some important thing. Some curves require super elevation. So I will talk about super elevations in a later slide. But as for the sake of the completeness, I will tell what is super elevation here. Super elevation is the slope of the road. If you see in this image, the middle image, the slope of the road is completely to this side. So you we call it the super elevation because the road is fully rotated to one side. Usually you road you see the roads as uh, you usually you see the roads rotated to two directions that means some at center line it comes like this and goes like these two directions but at a curve you have one direction slope we call it super elevation so the super elevation is used to counteract the effect of centrifugal force and to retard sliding and overturning and allow more uniform speed as well as for use of lesser land for uh, road design so we will be learning these things in later slides so here I will describe what is meant by super elevation and what is happening when your car or a vehicle is driving on a circular road so you may have learned this in your A, -level, a levels in physics movement along a circular path so if you consider this car, it is coming this inside this curve. So it will have a centrifugal force which which acts outside the which drags the vehicle outside of the curve. So that centrifugal force will drag this vehicle towards the outside edge of the curve. But you have the friction force acting inside direction to the curve because if the vehicle is going to slide to this way or drag to this way the super friction force will counteract that and it will uh, act towards this side or the inside of the curve because of the inclination of this road that means this super elevation this inclination means super elevation because of this inclination you have a component from the weight to inside of the curve, curve. You, the vehicle weight is coming down straight down but some component will act in, to the inside section of the road so the collection of this friction force and force due to inclination of road these two will counteract this centrifugal force so using the 
uh, equation f equals half m v squared, you can derive the equation something like this e plus f equals v squared 127r. So e means the super elevation as I told you, it is this inclination of the road. Then f is the coefficient of side friction between tire and road surface. That means when the vehicle is going to drag this way, the friction of the tire and road surface act along this way. So that friction is called the side, side friction. If you can remember, we learned about another friction factor called longitudinal friction factor that is acting along the road. This one is acting across the road. So then we have the design speed of the road and finally we have the radius of the curve. In, so we can see the movement of along a circular path depends on these factors especially V and R. If V is increasing R should be decreased. So R, R should also be increased. So from this equation E plus F equals V e squared over 127R we can get R as the subject and we can put all the things to the other side so you have R at the left and all the things other side so we can derive a minimum radius for a curve so if you take the minimum radius design speed for a road section is a constant value so it depends on E and F super elevation and side friction so this R would be minimum when E is maximum and F is maximum. So we get the minimum radius when you have lowest super maximum super elevation as well as maximum side friction. So now we will look at what is the maximum super elevation. So you cannot have as much as super elevation you like because inclination of the road depends on several factors or super elevation depends on several factors. What are these factors? One thing is terrain. Terrain means what kind of natural ground behavior you have in this area. If it is a flat terrain that means you have a flat area. You don't have high variation of the road. So you call it a flat terrain. If it is a rolling terrain, you have flat as well as some uh, mountainous type high sections in the road. If it is a mountainous terrain, you have a mountain to climb in that road section. You have a high steep slope in the road. So you call it mountainous terrain. So your super elevation depends on terrain type, flat, rolling or mountainous. Then type of area that means whether it is a rural area or a urban area for rural area we call them uh, open areas and urban areas we call them built up areas like here so then frequency of slow moving vehicles who might be influenced by high super elevation rates so what is this mean this means Slow moving vehicles that implies for trucks or heavy vehicles they are moving slowly. So if you have high super elevation rates and if you have so many slow moving vehicles if you can remember that a component of the vehicle load acts inside direction or the, uh, towards the center of the curve. So if you if I go back to this image so if this if you have a heavy vehicle here so this load will act on the ground and one component will act along the road so if you have a high inclination this load component will be high and it might uh, tend to it might cause the heavy vehicles to or uh, 
topple on the road. You may have seen this in roads. Sometimes the heavy vehicles are uh, fallen apart or they are toppled on the road because of the super elevation effect. So, in this table, this table is taken from RDA design guidelines. It will tell you if your road is if your road is in a flat terrain and if it is an open area, that means if it is a uh, rural area you have to use maximum super elevation of 6% so if you are trying to get the radius you have to use for a flat terrain you have to use e max of 6% that does not mean you have to always select 6% but the maximum is 6% you can use less than that value 6% or less than that value then for a rolling terrain you can go up to 8% and mountainous terrain you can go up to 10% so in the built up areas we always think that the highest super elevation is 6% no not more than that then the other factor maximum side friction factor the last in the equation it was e max plus f max so the maximum side friction factors are given in RDA design guidelines. So it depends on the design speed of the vehicle. So you can see these values depends on the design speed of the vehicles. The max values, the bituminous surfaces are the surfaces, uh, the asphalt surface or the tar roads. So that those are the friction values for tar roads. And this is for gravel roads, which is which we are using in uh, village roads. So these are the factors you have to use when calculating the minimum radius for a horizontal curve. So in these two parameters, we can define the recommended minimum curve radius for a road curve. That means in something like this. If I consider this. Row. If I consider this row, assume that you are assigned to design a road. So the design speed of the road is 30 kilometers per hour. Then you have to have a, let us say you have to have a road curve. You have to design a road curve. So now you are in a position to select the road curve. So when you draw the curve, you can you when you draw the curve, you want to have an idea. You need to have an idea what kind of radius I have to use for this design speed. So if you design the road for 30 kilometers per hour, and if we assume that road is in an urban area. So maximum super elevation you can go is 6%. For maximum super elevation 6%, for design speed of 30, the lowest radius you can go is 30 meters for the road curve. So the for the horizontal alignment you cannot use curves where, where your radius is less than 30 meters for design speed of 30 in an urban area so if you have a 25 meter radius that can't be so you have to increase the radius to 30 meters or more it is okay to have radius let us say 35 meters then it is okay because it is greater than 30 so that is the basis how to select the uh, road curves if so one for one more example if i use if we, if we assume that we are going to design a road with 50 kilometers per hour here 50 kilometers per hour let us say that is an urban area as well so you can have maximum super elevation of 6% so you have this row and this row so the lowest radius you can take is 90 meters so whatever the radius you 
apply to a curve in your world should be 90 or greater than that. So if if there's a situation you can't adopt 90 meter radius at some location, there are some certain precautions we can get, but generally you have to use a radius which is greater than 90 meter when you are designing a so, uh, design speed of 50 kilometers per hour. So that is about minimum radius of curves. You have to select the minimum radius and uh, depending on the design speed and depending on other scenarios. We learned about the maximum super elevation. So what is the minimum super elevation you can have? We learned about maximum super elevation. What is the minimum super elevation we can have? So what are the criteria? Uh, we need to consider when you think of the minimum super elevation. The minimum super elevation is used to cater the drainage requirement. So when you are constructing a road, you need to ensure that no water is uh, retained inside the road when it is raining or when it is a wet season or a wet condition. The water which uh, comes on top of the road should have to be drained out from the road. It cannot be uh, retained or it cannot be stored or it cannot be stay on the road uh, until it is dried out. So we need to make sure that uh, there is no water retained on the road when it is raining or a wet, at, when, it is, when the road is at a wet condition. So the minimum super elevation is selected to cater the drainage, drainage requirement. In Sri Lanka, the minimum super elevation is minus 2.5. Minimum super elevation means you might have, you can uh, actually uh, when, we, when you are, when the vehicle is driving on a curve, we learn that to uh, counteract the centrifugal force we need super elevation but on a straight section we don't need super elevation so that means we can have a flat road but if you have a flat road it will not drain out the water from road so in straight section especially to drain out the water from the road surface we use a inclination to the road so we call it the normal cross pole it is minus 2.5 for each direction of the road if this, this is the center line of the road it will slope down minus 2.5 slope so that is the general practice in sri lanka but this minus 2.5 value or this normal cross pole uh, is changed from country to country depending on their design guideline in USA, they might usually use minus 2. In uh, Australia, they use minus 3. So in Sri Lanka, what we use is minus 2.5. Then we, have, we are looking at the concept called adverse cross fold. So what is adverse cross fold? So to describe this, I will go back to the slide in where we learned about uh, motion along a circular path. So in this uh, slide, we see the inclination of the road and the friction force will counteract the centrifugal force. So the inclination of the road or otherwise the super elevation of the road will depend on the radius of that curve. If the recurve radius is high you might not have higher super elevation. If the curve radius is lower you might you should have higher super elevation. So, 
if this radius is high that means you don't need much super elevation so when this radius is high the curve radius is high this friction force can single handedly tackle this centrifugal force he does not need the force due to inclination of the road so that means the curve does not need super elevation at this curve radius so at that that uh, the at that radius that means at a higher radius this super elevation or the inclination of road will not be used to counteract the centrifugal force the friction force itself counteract the centrifugal force so that means you don't need to incline this road so you don't need to incline this road instead you can use the normal cross pole at that section so usually at a curve in this curve your road is sloped like this but at the high at a higher radius if this friction force single handedly counteract this centrifugal force you can have this road like this slope two ways so you call that radius adverse cross pole you call that radius adverse cross pole this adverse cross pole means at that cross radius your road has a normal cross pole it don't have a super elevation it will only have a normal cross pole so to have the adverse cross pole we select the side friction values as 0.06 and 0.07 for open areas 0.06 that means f max and for built up areas it is 0.07 so when you calculate the uh, radius the radius would come if the design speed is 30 the uh, adverse cross pole for a open area would be 205 for a built up area it would be 160 so if your curve is 205 you don't need to have super elevation that so if i uh, make it more clear if you have a radius of 100 meters you should have super elevation of 2.5 because the if the design speed is 30 and your radius your super, uh, radius is 100 meters that means more than 35 you should have super elevation of 2.5 so if when your radius is more than the adverse cross pole or equal to adverse cross pole your super elevation will not be there your super elevation would be the normal cross pole so there won't be any super elevation that super elevation would be replaced by the normal cross pole so we will be learning it more clearly in when you are learning about super elevation section but for the moment you can you have to understand if, you, if your curve radius is greater than the uh, adverse cross pole you have to use normal cross pole for the road that's about adverse cross pole then we will learn about the types of horizontal curves we have several types of curves circular curves transition curves reverse curves and unidirection curves circular curves are simple curves transition curves i told you earlier they are the radius changing from infinity to some definite definite value yeah, like in the first slide i told you about changing the radius from infinity to 1000 like that reverse curves and unidirection curves are a uh, type of curves where you have uh, two curves in same direction or two curves in different direction so we will be learning this then here this is a simple curve you have a curve on the road we call it a simple curve then unidirectional curve means you have two curves in the same direction sometimes there may be a small straight section in the middle sometimes there won't be a straight section you have two curves two radius of 
curves on the road. So if you have a small tangent section or a straight section, we call it a broken back curve. Otherwise, we call this a compound curve. So in reverse curves, you have a curve coming from one direction and rotate, changing its direction to the other side. There may be a small tangent in between. So this is a reverse curve with tangent and this is a reverse curve without tangent. So if I see this image, you can see here I have a curve going this direction and I have another curve in the same direction with a small straight section in the middle. So we call this a broken back curve. You have a curve in the same direction, you have another curve with a straight section in the middle. So if you don't have this straight section, only these two curves, you call it a, a unidirectional curve. In here you can see this is this curve is coming this direction and it is changing the direction to the other side. You call it a reverse curve. It's coming from this side and change the direction to the other side. So this section you have a reverse curve, in this section you have a compound curve. So that is about horizontal alignment. We learned about the horizontal alignment. What are the curves? What are the straights? What are the uh, transition sections? And we learned about super elevation. And uh, we learned about the radius of curves. What are the minimum radius of curves we have to adopt? And then we learned about maximum super elevation and minimum super elevation we, are, we have to use in urban conditions and rural conditions. And we then we talked about the minimum super elevations where we have to cater the drainage requirement and finally we learned about the adverse cross fault yeah, you don't need super elevation at the curve because at adverse cross fault the super elevation itself counteracts the centrifugal force then finally we learned about the various types of horizontal curves we have simple curves, even directional curves, reverse curves and the transition curves. So in the next section we will be looking at the uh, super elevation one of the hardest and important uh, criteria, important section in highway geometric design. So we will be looking at that in the next section. In this lecture, we are going to look at the super elevation of a road. Super elevation is one of the most important thing in highway geometric design. So, we have some kind of introduction about super elevation under horizontal alignment section. You know now what is the value of super elevation we need to consider depending on the radius of an alignment or the radius of a curve. In this section we are looking at how to apply super elevations to an alignment. So here in this section we are looking at the super elevation according to RDA design guidelines. Uh, if you think this is a plan view of the road, this is a straight section, this red part and this blue section is a uh, curved portion. In the straight section you have a road of this kind, you have slopes both sides of the road from the center line, you call this the normal cross fall. When you come into the curve to provide proper centrifugal force we have to rotate this pavement or rotate this road in such a way that it provides the centrifugal acceleration to counteract the centrifugal force. So in that scenario your pavement will look like this. It will rotate like this. So when the curve is rotating in this direction we call it a clockwise direction curve. So, 
this clockwise direction curve you can see your right side is turned upward and your left side is turned downward so if you can compare these two images you can see your uh, actually your right side is at the bottom side and your left side is at the top side so if you consider compare these two images you can see the right side of the of both images have same slope or kind of same uh, direction it is sloping into the same direction but when you consider the left side in the first image or in the straight section the left side slope this way downward but it has turned upward from the center line it has turned upward in the uh, curve so you can see the road has turned from this view to this view within this curve this uh, along this road so actually what has happened is this let us say in this straight section you have your road as minus 2.5 super elevation we call it normal cross pole and when you come inside the curve you have for the left side you have plus 2.5 and to the right side you have minus 2.5 so since this right side is same but your left side have different super elevation or different slopes so if you consider the right side this right side has to rotate upward and come to plus 2.5 some in somewhere in this road so it will occur along some distance it will occur along some distance we call it super elevation transition this super elevation transition from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 it, occur, it occurs along some distance we call it super elevation transition distance so otherwise we call it super elevation development length so I have named this section as super elevation transition without spirals if you can remember spirals are curves where you change the radius from infinite to a definite value but without spiral means this straight and curve is smoothly joined that means there is no spiral this straight section is tangent to this curved section this is this this is kind of a smooth connection but if you have a spiral curve that is more desirable for drivers that is more smooth connection than this one but in this lecture series we will not be looking at the spirals we will not be looking at only uh, roads without spirals so now we have some kind of idea this super elevation transition is happening inside this road to rotate the pavement from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 so we call this as attainment of super elevation so the change of super elevation from normal cross pole to full super elevation that means from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 is called the super elevation development length actually even if i when i say minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 it is only for this example but if this is super elevation minus 5 and plus 5 this distance would be the super elevation development length so it should be gradually uh, it should be gradually over a distance without appreciable reduction in speed or safety or comfort so when you are rotating the pavement you have to rotating the pavement along some distance of the road so that should be a gradual variation of the pavement rotation so it, it might not feel to the driver that there is a uh, change in the cross slope of the road change in the, the slope of the road so we call it uh, the comfort effect of the road so 
when we are rotating the road it should be rotating at the rate that is comfortable for the driver so there are three methods to uh, attain super elevation development length but mainly what we are using is rotate the pavement about the center line if i go here this pavement is rotated along the center line you can see this part is turned upward along this so about this center line so most in most cases we are rotating the pavement about the center line that is they are we uh, consider super elevation development length so this is actually what happens in developing super elevation you have a normal crown section or a normal straight section your road will be like this if it is normal crown this is minus 2.5 then it is going into a curve in the curve you have full super elevation that, that is kind of super elevation value if you say this value is 2.5 this side will be minus minus 2.5 this side will be plus 2.5 as in the previous image we saw if this is minus uh, if the super elevation is plus 4 this side should be minus 4 this side should be plus 4 plus 4 so in this example this curve will this curve will be super elevated like this inside the curve so you can see along this length this left side is turned upward along this length this left side is turned upward or rotate upward to get the required super elevation so from the start of rotation to stop of the complete rotation there is some distance along the road we call it the super elevation development length this length can be calculated by two methods according to RLA design guidelines they are relative gradient method and rate of payment rotation method so this relative gradient method is depends or is uh, designed or defined uh, com by considering the appearance criteria that means this rotation is uh, taken place with some distance if this distance is very uh, low so the driver see that within a short period or short length of road the payment is rotated the driver see it. so that in that case the appearance criteria is not good in other in other uh, case about the comfort criteria where you have the rate of payment rotation if this payment is rotated and come to full super elevation in a small length or a very lesser length the driver feels that when he is driving in the in the curve suddenly the ro uh, payment rotates suddenly the road slope ro uh, changes it, it feels to the drivers and the people inside the vehicle so in that case your comfort criteria is not satisfied so there are two methods to calculate this super elevation development length so that you can have, you can get the relative gradient method with appearance criteria and rate of payment rotation with comfort criteria so when you are calculating the super elevation development length you will need to calculate for both of these methods and get the maximum value from these two methods so when you get the maximum value it will satisfy both these criteria. So that is how to uh, get the super elevation development length. Actually, how how we uh, calculate super elevation development length. Now we are going to see the the equation to calculate the super elevation development length. So first we will look at the relative gradient method. So this is the equation for relative gradient methods. It is given as LE, which is the super elevation development length, equals W into E plus N over GR. So 
LE means superficial development length as I told you earlier. W means width of the carriageway including hard shoulder. So if you can remember the lecture we told about the cross section of the roadway I told you carriageway and uh, what is carriageway and what is lane width and what is hard shoulder. So this W means lane width plus hard shoulder width. Usually uh, the, uh, the correct way to get this would be the lane width. W is usually considered at, as lane width but in Sri Lanka we uh, use both uh, lane width and hard shoulder width for W. So that means W equals addition of lane width and hard shoulder width. So E means the super elevation of the curve and N means the normal cross fall. So E plus N means uh, without considering this E plus N uh, part what actually happens is how much of a rotation has happened inside the curve. That means if I go back to this previous slide here actually the rotation is happening on the left side right side is fixed so what how much from how much a change is happening on the left side that is meant by the e plus n term e plus n means minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 yeah, how much change from minus 2.5 to plus plus 2.5 that that change is 5 so e plus n equals 5 that is how to get that easily without considering those this e plus n term you just think from how much the payment values change that is the easiest way then there is a factor called relative gradient and it should be obtained using the relative gradient table so if you have one lane which is rotating that means if there is a if that is a two lane road each lane would be rotated separately so you have to use this equation uh, use this column to get the gr value if you are designing for 50 km per hour and if it is a two lane road you should take 0.671 as gr so if it is a four lane road uh, two lanes would be rotated in one side you have to learn, use this uh, two lane column if the lanes number of lanes are more than four lanes you have to use this uh, column actually uh, if, you, if the road is uh, a single way road or one way road if the, if the number of lanes are greater than two you have to use this column if the number of lanes are uh, greater than one or equals to two you have to use this column if it is a uh, one way road so it depends on the rotation lanes uh, in the actual scenario so that is how to get the gr value now we are moving on to the other method which is the rate of payment rotation method in that method we are uh, defining the super elevation development length as LE equals E plus N into V over 3.6 beta so LE is the length of super elevation development length E plus N term as I told you earlier it implies how much of change in the super elevation occurs in this transition or in this super elevation development length so it is the same thing we learned in the relative gradient criteria. Then V is the design speed of the road in kilometers per hour. Then beta factor depends on the design speed of the road. So if your design speed is less than 80 kilometers per hour, your beta value should be 0.035. If your design speed is greater than 80 kilometers per hour or equal to 80 kilometers per hour, you have to use the beta value as 0.025
then we have something called positioning of super elevation development lens so up to this point we have learned what is the super elevation development length we need to get to rotate the pavement or rotate the road to achieve the super elevation from normal cross pole to a value of some kind of super elevation so if i move back to this slide you know this super elevation development length then there is a thing we have to consider that is where we need to place this length of super elevation because there is a straight portion and there is a curved portion so we need to know whether we put this all le length that means whether we rotate this total payment within the straight section or within the curved section or some part of in the straight section and some part in the curved section so we have something called positioning of uh, super elevation development so positioning of super elevation development means on curve how much we put the super elevation length on straight how much we put the super elevation development length so here we have three definitions how to uh, distribute super elevation development length among each entity so in the in within this lesson we learned that we have single circular curves uh, reverse curves and unidirectional curves i have to mention that uh, unidirectional curves we have to avoid as much as possible that are uh, they are not desirable for alignment design there is if in any case if you cannot avoid unidirectional curve you can use them otherwise you have to avoid them as far as you could so first we will look at how to distribute super elevation development plane or position super elevation development plane along a single circular curve so in a single circular curve it says Two third of the length of super elevation development length is to be provided prior to the tangent point, and one third of the super elevation development length should be positioned within the curve. So these are RDA guidelines. This is uh, given in the RDA guidelines. So in other guidelines such as H2 or so, they have some other definitions, but this one is related to RDA design guidelines. So it says the development length should be two third should be on the tangent and one third should be on the uh, curve so if your super elevation development length is 30 if it is a simple curve or a single circular curve your uh, 20 meter length would be on the tangent side and the 10 meter would be on the uh, curve side so In this example, we assume this is a simple curve. So, if I recall what is a simple curve, simple curve means a curve where you have two sides connected to a large, uh, larger straight section. That means before the curve you have a larger straight and after the curve also you have a larger straight section or a lengthy straight section. Sometimes instead of a straight section you may have a a uh, very large radius curve such as 2000 1000 or something like that it depends on the uh, design speed so whatever the curve radius which is uh, greater than the adverse cross pole would be a larger radius curve so we will be learning this in later super elevation uh, lecture notes uh, within civil 3d uh, software section so in this example now we have a simple curve so assume this is a straight and you have a curve here so in the straight section you have normal cross pole minus 2.5 both sides this blue color represent the left side red color represent the right side so when the super elevation 
occurs at the when you when the super elevation or inclination of the road uh, becomes 2.5 at the curve your left side would be rotated up to plus 2.5 super elevation but your right side would be remain as minus 2.5 so in this example you can see your left side is always minus 2.5 but your right side is with the length it will be rotated up to plus 2.5 plus from minus 2.5 so in this development sometimes you will find a situation where you have a flat crown or a level section in this left side and it like it is gradually increasing up to plus 2.5 so that is how the super elevation is developed along this simple curve so the positioning of super elevation would be from this length from this super elevation development length two third of this length would be on the tangent section and one third would be on the straight section that is the definition for simple curve so we will uh, look at another example related to simple curve this time you have normal cross pole and once you get the super elevation your value would be plus 5 so that is kind of a sharper curve so your left side would be minus 2.5 and it would be rotated up to plus 5 and your right side it is going from minus 2.5 to minus 5 so if you uh, think about the change here right left side would be changing from minus 2.5 to plus 5 so when you are calculating the super elevation development plane always you have to select the largest change so in this case you can see left side is uh, from minus 2.5 to plus 5 and right side is minus 2.5 to minus 5 this change is only minus 2.5 but this change is 7.5 so when you calculate the super elevation development length you have to take this e plus n term as 7.5 according to the uh, super elevation development equations so now there is now you can look at how this is developed so in the normal first pole you have minus 2.5 and minus 2.5 there will be then with the with some distance this left side increases but the right side remain as same and at one instance both the side become plus two minus 2.5 and plus 2.5 that means uh, same super elevation but different uh, values minus 2.5 and plus 2.5 in this location we call this reverse crown both super elevations are equal but the sign is different so after this point both sides of the road will be rotated up to the required super elevation from this point this one would be rotated to minus 5 this one would be rotated to plus 5 that is how we get it so that is how the super elevation is developed and developed inside the curves in in the same manner as i told you earlier the super elevation development lens would be placed two thirds along the straight and one third along the curve so this is another way of representing the super elevation development so this is your curve this is a simple curve where e equals 2.5 your super elevation is e 2.5 as in example 1 so this is a curve this is a straight this is a curve this tc means tangent to curve point this is tangent this is curve this is tangent to curve point ct means curve to tangent point this is the curve this is the tangent so inside the curve you have super elevated section and from this super elevation development one third this l is the super elevation development length so l over 2 will be inside the curve 2 l over 3 will be outside the curve or in the straight section if you uh, think about the super elevation at each section 
at the start you have the uh, normal crowd in this position you have the full super elevation so if you consider the other side of the road other side of the curve it has the same thing you have full super elevation up to this point so in this red color means the right side right side is going upward so that is why we call it it is going upward this is the e equals zero line super elevation e equals zero line so this is super elevation equals plus 2.5 this is super elevation equals minus 2.5 so after this point within this curve plus 2.5 will be continued so after at the end of this curve you will have the same super elevation development as this one if this is a simple curve so we will uh, position that super elevation development length l by l over 3 and 2 l over 3 as in the start of the curve so you will be having same uh, super elevation development and same pavement rotation within that uh, single circular curve so that is how to position super elevation development length within a single circular curve so in this where you have the super elevation development length greater than 2.5 in this case we call this point the reverse crown location this is the location where you have minus 2.5 and plus 2.5 so after this point both side would be rotated so from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 your right side would be coming like this but until this plus 2.5 point left side would be always minus 2.5 after that both this uh, pavement rotates both sides rotates and go to the required super elevation if you remember the last example this value should be plus 5 and minus 5 according to that example so your development length should be uh, divided according to the single circular curve so this is how to develop super elevation development length in a reverse curve so you have one curve coming like this and you have tangent to curve point then you have a small straight then you have a curve to tangent point and you have another curve but that curve is in the other direction so since this is a curve this has a super elevation so this is going on the left side this is an anti-clockwise direction curve we call it anti-clockwise direction so your right side would be at a plus super elevation left side would be at a minus super elevation then on the other curve it is a clockwise curve your left side it is at a plus super elevation and uh, right side would be at a minus super elevation so in that case you have to first find the super elevation zero point super elevation zero point we call it level crown this point is called lc first you need to find that one that is uh, lc equals uh, tc plus tc plus tc means tangent to curve point plus le1 over e1 plus e2 this L is same as this L uh, this L this uh, this L is same as this short tangent length so this short short tangent length L E1 means the super elevation of this curve E2 means the super elevation of this curve so we will proportionately uh, distribute the super elevation throughout this length that is how to get this lc point so after getting lc point you will be finding the l1 and l2 but you need the l1 without finding this point you can calculate l1 and l2 l1 means the super elevation of sorry super elevation development length of this curve and l2 is super elevation development length of this curve this lc point would be needed to distribute the super elevation so we will uh, we will uh, look at this lc point 
uh, within the uh, civil 3d section how to distribute that one so now in this uh, session we will find how to get this l1 length l1 length is this one after find this this 11 crown you have to uh, get the next point or find the point where super elevation change in the curve 1 uh, from this point it is going downward up to the super elevation of other side because the right side super this, this right side super elevation becomes minus on the other curve so from this point it will change and come to this point so this length would be l1 l1 equals w means the lane with the hard shoulder width and e1 would be the super elevation of this curve and the gr relative gradient and uh, this is only for relative gradient but you have to calculate for uh, rate of payment rotation as well and get the maximum value so this l2 is for the other curve so you can find the super elevation development length this length for this curve also for this curve also with l2 same equation but your super elevation value should be used for the second curve so that is that is how to position super elevation in a reverse curve mainly what we do is position reverse uh, super elevation in between the short tangent so if this short tangent is zero that means after this curve is right after this curve you will start the other curve no tangent there so this pc and t ct point this length l becomes zero so this in that case lc equal to tc o ct since this l is zero lc will be equal to tc o ct so that is how to uh, position find the uh, super elevation zero point for reverse curves then i have this uh, unidirectional curves so if i move back to the presentation here unidirection uh, for reverse curves all or most super elevation development length must be within circular arc for well faced tangent straight as single curves so this is the same thing i explained a uh, little bit earlier so in this what we have done was this one so if you have a larger tangent in between two curves they will be treated as single circular curves like this case so unidirectional curves uh, you have to uh, to place the super elevation in such a way that uh, for closely spaced tangent points position the super elevation change in evenly about the tangent points or for well spaced tangent points uh, you have to uh, use the flatter super elevation until the uh, curve of higher super elevation so i will be uh, teaching this super elevation development uh, in a much uh, better way within the civil 3d class so we will be looking in more detail inside uh, that lecture so after that we will look at an example simple example how to calculate the super elevation development length so in this example we have consider a two lane road in a rural flat terrain with following parameters lane width equals 3.5 meters hard shoulder is 0.5 meter design speed is 60 kilometers per hour according to the given horizontal alignment develop the super elevation diagram for this road using rda geometric design guidelines considering the relative gradient method so we are not going to develop the super elevation diagram but in this example we will be doing calculating the super elevation development length so this is a typical alignment so what this is saying is this is a straight section so if this straight section starts from 0 and it comes until 206.27 that is the length of this part and after that point we have a curve and that curve will be end at 263.91 then again you have a long straight section 
it will go up to 420.18 so after that you have a curve of radius 725 then that, that is going up to 520.18 so likewise you have this alignment so it is asked we are asking to uh, develop the super elevation uh, development length so it is saying that this is a rural flat terrain so since it is a rural flat terrain you have to uh, memorize that you can uh, let us say you, we are going to use uh, since it is a flat terrain you can't go super elevation more than six percent that is that that is what the rda guideline says so since this is a rural area, also we have larger area curves, 725, 700, 300. You will need to uh, look at the super elevation and adverse cross pole because of these larger radius curves with rural ter uh, flat terrain. So first we will look at the radius things here. You have 140, 725, 700, 300. So, this is the recommended minimum radius curves I gave you in the horizontal alignment lecture. So we have our design speed is 60 and we have radius of 140 that is the lowest radius. So it is in between super elevation 4 and 5. So you cannot interpolate and get the super elevation value in this case. You have to get the super elevation value which is the closest one or and the uh, which is the closest one to this radius it should if, if, if you call this 140 this is less than 145 so you can't have super elevation 4 but it is greater than 135 so whatever the radius greater than 135 and less than 145 you have to use super elevation 5 so 140 radius curve that means this curve you have to use to pay elevation 5. Then you have radius 300, 725 and uh, 700. So all these super elevation should be up be 2.5 because whatever the curve greater than 155 radius will have super elevation of 2.5 but we have to check whether it is if the radius is beyond adverse cross pole because I told you at the adverse cross pole radius you don't need to apply super elevation you can go with the normal cross pole so this is the adverse cross pole situation so for the adverse cross pole this open area or otherwise we call it the uh, uh, rural area adverse cross pole radius would be 810 so in this example you have 725 700 uh, 300 radius so you have it is less than 810 so you all you have all of the curves you should have super elevation of 2.5 because it is greater than 155 radius so these are the super elevations you have for curve 1 you have e equals 5, curve 2 you have e equals 2.5, curve 3 also you have e equals 2.5 and curve 4 you have e equals 2.5 as well. So if you check up, uh, think about the start section, this section of curve 1 it is acting as a simple curve that means you have a long straight and a curve. So long straight and a curve this is a this is this this part is acting as a simple curve so in this section you have minus 2.5 super elevation that is normal cross pole in this section you have plus 5 super elevation so minus 2.5 to plus 5 your delta e otherwise uh, e plus n would be 7.5 so if you consider the n side of this curve it has the same characteristics as the uh, start side so curve and long straight so it has the same characteristics so curve in your e plus n is 7.5 as well so we put the equation relative gradient method equation lv equals w into e plus n over gr 
so your w is total rotated with that is our shoulder with plus plane width that is 3.5 into 0.5 that is 4 meters so this is 4 meters and this change is 7.5 and gr for uh, 60 kilometers per hour is 0.63 if you can uh, look at that so values for gr in the in start of the presentation we will find this value is uh, 0.63 so when you calculate this you will get 47.62 so if you can remember for simple curves when you are distributing the super elevation development length we say two thirds of the length would be uh, at the tangent and one third would be on the curve so in this case we are selecting a length which is divisible by 3 so because you have the 2 third and you have 2 third and 1 third so 47.62 we choose it or we select 48 so 1 third would be 16 and 2 third would be 32 so on tangent we will have a length of 32 and on curve we will have a length of 16 so uh, this is for the start of the curve your curve end also like a simple curve so you have the same calculation for the curve end as well and you will get these same values so if you go to the start of curve 2 this curve 2 has a long straight section and a curve so this is acting as a simple curve so you can do the same calculation as before to get this value for this part e plus n equals 5 because this is minus 2.5 this is plus 2.5 so elevation minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 that the change is 5 so that is how we get this so that length we come you select as 33 to, divis to be divisible by uh, 3 so curve 1 curve 2 start act as a simple curve uh, then curve to end we must uh, consider about the curve to end this is a reverse curve this curve is turning this side the other curve is turning other side this is a reverse curve with a common tangent point that means that uh, tangent point length is zero there is no tangent at all common tangent point so that length would be if you can recall here that length would be l for this, this side l1 w e1 over gr for this side l2 equals w e2 over gr so here w e1 over gr 4 into e1 means this super elevation 2.5 gr is 0.63 in this case we are just rounding up to a uh, full value or a uh, zero decimal place uh, we are not rounding up to a value which is divisible by three because we are not uh, positioning super elevation development one third or two third here just putting this value so on the other side curve three star that means this one it is also part of that reverse curve so it is w e2 over gr so this e and this e is equal so you have the same length here so again you have another reverse curve here so curve 3 end and curve 4 start so you can calculate this in your own and see what is happening you what are the values you get and this curve 3 end would be a reverse curve with a short tangent and curve 4 start will also be a reverse curve with a short tangent and curve for end this side would be another simple curve because you have the curve and you have a long straight so you can by yourself calculate these lengths and see what is coming here so i will be discussing these things in a later day with the complete exercise so that is about super elevation development length according to RDA design guidelines. So in the next, next lecture,
we will be looking at another way of calculating super elevation development length that is according to OSROAD guidelines that is different from the RDA guidelines so we will be looking at that one also uh, to have an idea about how the super elevation development lengths are calculated in other parts of the world In the previous video, we learned about how to attain super elevation through RDA guidelines. In this, what we are doing is attainment of super elevation through post road guidelines. Basically, the selection of radius for each curve related to design speed and vertical. Uh, alignment guidelines so those things are more or less sim similar in all the guidelines in only small differences but the attainment of super elevation there are some differences that is why I am especially uh, teaching you this short method and the RDA method and also there is a store guidelines so you can have a look about that in this session what we are doing is attainment of supervision in terms of post-road guidelines. It is same as the one we talked about through RDA guidelines but there are small differences in between where you get the supervision development length. So in this example what we are doing is the supervision transitions without spirals. So as I explained this in my previous video, so you have the normal first fall and you have the full super elevated section inside the curve. In between we have a super elevation transition. Even though I have used 2.5 values as normal first falls, uh, especially in uh, Australia guidelines, they use minus 3 as the normal first fall in Australia. Uh, here I have used the old image I used in our RDA guidelines that is why I am using minus 2.5. Then we have two methods to get the super elevation development length. But there are new things to discover here because we have two components in super elevation development. That is super elevation runoff and tangent runoff. If you can remember what RDA guidelines taught you, that is, you get the super elevation development by either relative gradient method or rate of payment rotation method. Only what you get is the length of payment rotation, length of the super elevation development. Then you <coughs> divided it into the curve and the straight according to the criteria. Or if it is in a reverse curve, you have some way of doing that but instead we have two things called super elevation runoff SRO and tangent runoff so super elevation runoff means the length you require to change your cross pole from flat super elevation to the super elevated section so here I have described it the length of road they needed to accomplish the change in first pole from flat first pole to a fully superabated first pole. That means if you consider this section, this left side will be super elevating. So super elevation runoff. This means where are you pavement first slope is from zero super elevation, that means level to a value which is specified by the super elevation. So this distance is called the super elevation runoff and this distance is called the tangent runoff where you change from normal cross pole to level ground or levels E equals zero location. This distance is called the tangent runoff. If you get the super elevation diagram, you can see this is 
Now my first goal point, this is level crown point. Up to this point, the length is tangent and out. Then from level crown point, or the super elevation zero point, to the full super elevation point, you have super elevation run out. So that is the two criteria you have to remember when you are doing super elevation development length with a short guidelines. This thing is not there in RDA guideline. So there are two methods as I told you earlier, earlier to get the super elevation development length. That is payment rate of payment rotation method in a short and relative gradient method. So both of these were in RDA guidelines also, but there are some little differences. Actually, this thing is more or less the same one, but the relative gradient method has a little more difference than the RDA one. So this rate of payment rotation, length of super elevation development length is given by this equation. So you can substitute the values to this equation and get the super elevation development length. So this LRRO length of super elevation development related to rate of payment rotation is from the change of payment cross pole from normal cross pole to full super elevation. That means this LE normal cross pole to full super elevation. That is the value given by this equation. Then we move on to the next method that is relative gradient method. So we have this kind of equation. So this is same as the super elevation development length we talked earlier. So E1 would be the normal cross pole, E2 would be the full super elevation value. This GR is the important value we have to consider in this uh, location. I will give you more detail on this in the next slide. And WR is the width from axis of rotation to the outside edge of running lanes. That means the lane width actually. In other words, this is the lane width. So here you have values for GR. For lane one lane, if the lane width is 3.5, you have the GR values. You can remember we have this GR range means the uh, maximum relative gradient. So we had this in RDA design guidelines too. But in a show there is a little more difference because you can calculate GR from this equation. Either for this one or this one, depending on your speed. If your speed is less than 80 kilometers per hour, you have to use this one. If it is equal or greater than 80 kilometers per hour, you have to use this equation. So you have to use your lane width here. So let us say you calculate uh, GR for 50 kilometers per hour. You put 50 here. If your lane width is let us say 3.6 meters, you put it here, then you calculate the value. So if this value is less than this value, that means 0.75. So for 50 design speed, for one lane your maximum relative gradient is 0.75. Once you calculate it here, if the value is less than 0.75, you can use that lower value to this equation. If it is greater than this value, that means if it is greater than 0.75, you have to use 0.75 in this equation. That is the importance of uh, GR in this relative gradient method. So that is about relative gradient methods to get the length of super elevation development. Then we will see how to position super elevation development length through the straights and curves. In RDA guideline, you, you may remember that I have told you we put one third of the super elevation development length inside the curve and two thirds outside the curve or on the straight section. For 
For short method, if it is a single circular curve, that means you don't have any spirals. So your portion of super elevation runoff will be located like this. So your operating speed is 20 to 70. So you will be putting 80% on the straight section. This means portion of super elevation runoff located prior to the circular curve. That means prior to the circular curve means on the straight. So this is 80%. In RDA guideline it was 66% or 67, 67%. That means two thirds. But here you have 80% of the super elevation in the tangent section and only 20% on the curve section. So if the speed is greater than 80, you have to use 70%. Then in terms of reverse curves, uh, it is saying that reverse curves should have sufficient distance between the, the curves to introduce full super elevation development for each curves without exceeding the standard rate of change in super elevation for the particular operating speed. This means it is assuming that you have a small tangent in between the reverse curve so that you can apply super elevation development length. So if you consider about a reverse curve, in a reverse curve you don't have a tangent runout section because in reverse curve you don't have a normal cross pole. It is going one super elevation to the other super elevation. So there is no something called there is nothing something called normal crown in that section. So you don't have a tangent runout section. So you have only super elevation runoff for one curve and the super elevation runoff for the other curve. In this what is assuming is both these runoff lengths are in the tangent in between the previous curve. So if, if that cannot be placed you have to use this table 7.2 which is this one to divide the super elevation development length inside the curve. But not only that, there are so many things about reverse curves in Ostrode. So there is something called Appendix I of Ostrode Part 3 in 2016 version provides additional information regarding super elevation development for a number, type, number of types of reverse curve. If you got a chance you can uh, view this and see there are a lot of occasions you can apply super elevation development length inside reverse curves, not only the one we talked about. So I hope I better you if you have some time you can repair this. You should repair this appendix I of a short part 3 2016. Then about compound curve, that means the curves which is rotating in the same direction with uh, different curve radius. So where compound curves are provided, the super elevation on the smaller curve should be developed on the large curve radius prior to the common tangent point. So at a compound curve, your super elevation in the smaller curve, for smaller curve super elevation will be higher. So that should be developed on the larger radius curve prior to the common tangent point. That means if there is a common tangent point, super elevation development should be occurred before the smaller radius curve. That means it should be within the, it should be fully within the large radius curve. So that is what is saying here. So that's about uh, elevation development within the short guidelines. So this is a small summary of the short guidelines. There are so many things to know on this guideline, but I think this is some uh, summer, see some summary of the guidelines so that you can follow if you need to learn about a source so you can 
get an idea from this and you can thoroughly follow the stroke guidelines later how to how the things happen in a stroke guideline. In this section we are going to learn something called curve widening or otherwise we are calling it pavement widening. So when traveling on curves vehicles accommodate more width than they travel on straight road. So if you look at this image, uh, this is the center line of the road. This magenta color lines are the center line of the uh, travel vehicle. So this vehicle is traveled along a center line in this lane. So this white line and this red line or the center line is a lane and this is the center of that lane and after that we have the hard shoulder. So usually the vehicles are expected to run inside the lane. So but we will look at how it is going to happen when the when a vehicle is traveling on a curve, especially a heavy vehicle. So here this vehicle is traveling. Now these tracks uh, tires are inside the lane. So you will see what happens when it comes inside the curve. So this outside tires are going outside the lane so this is the lane this area is the lane but the outside tires are going out of the lane it is inside the hard shoulder sometimes it may go outside the hard shoulder also so in that case what we need is we need to increase the width of the lane so that the full width of the vehicle will be accommodated inside the uh, lane of the road so this is called this increased width inside these curves are called the curve widening or else the pavement widening so this is also called travel way widening because we are widening the travel way. There is some other widening called uh, side distance widening. It will be used when uh, the side distance obstruct by a object in the road. So we call we widening the widening the road. We call it side distance widening. But in this case what we do is travel way widening which is uh, increasing the width of the road inside curves. So this is specially used for heavy vehicles as you saw in that example light vehicles such as car or vans will not be affected by the curve uh, radius but for large vehicles like trucks or buses they might go outside the lane when they are getting the uh, curves when they are traveling on the curves especially for sharper curves so this travel way widening depends on four factors they are radius of curve and width of the lane in straight section uh, straight section means that straight sections we don't have any widening so we consider that normal lane width of a straight section then the vehicle characteristics such as design vehicle or what kind of vehicle they are and the parts uh, connected to that vehicle so if you consider about a truck you have a uh, front part and a rear part so depending on the vehicle characteristics the widening may be different so we need to uh, define the widening for the uh, design vehicle we learn what is design vehicle in the earlier lectures so we have to uh, design or we have to uh, think about or think about or we have to assign widening on curves according to the design vehicle then the last one is lateral clearance between two vehicles because when a vehicle is traveling on a curve and another vehicle coming on inside other side of the curve or otherwise 
if this vehicle is overtaking another vehicle there may be a small gap between two vehicles when the overtaking is taken place uh, usually in straight sections this gap is little bit low but in curved section the drivers maintain more gap to have more safer uh, overtaking or uh, traversing movement inside the curve so this is the table or this is the values defined in rda guidelines for curve widening usually curve widening is a very expensive thing you because you have to widen the pavement or the widening the uh, lanes to accommodate this vehicle paths so usually if this widening width is less than 0.6 meter we ignore that widening so we don't widen in that if the widening is greater than 0.6 meters we will be widening the road so in this table you have the amount of widening according to the radius of the curve and according to the width of the lane the actually width of the uh, total lane width i mean this 6.2 meter means 3 point into one direction and 3 point into other direction likewise so depending on that data these widening values are defined for example if your radius is 140 and if your uh, design speed is 30 and your lane width is 3.1 meter so you will be having a 0.8 meter uh, widening width so that is how to get the widening values so if you have a uh, lane width in between these values you can use interpolation then about the application of curve widening how the curve widening is placed because on straight sections you have one lane width if you have a curve widening inside the curves you have another lane width so this lane width have to be uh, positioned inside the curves as well as in the straight section so how this widening is application is described here on simple curves without spirals widening should be placed on the inside edge of the pavement usually we are placing the widening in the inside edge of the pavement because that is the side where the heavy vehicles going outside the curve so in curve widening will be attained gradually over a length to sufficient to make the whole carriage way fully usable so this curve widening will be obtained so if the straight section lane width is 3.5 and inside the curve with curve widening if the lane width is 4 meter so 3.5 to 4 meter width will be gradually attained inside the uh, travel way otherwise it the carriage way won't be fully usable if you suddenly increase the uh, width of the lane it, the other part would not be is uh, usable so instead of that what we do is we are gradually increasing the width of the road from one width to the other width so this widening will be attained usually over the super elevation development lane but if you can use shorter lanes they can also be used so usually these widths are changed which are changed in within a distance of 60, 30 meter to 60 meter. So that is about widening of uh, horizontal curves. Then we will be looking at something called lateral clearance. clearance. So this thing is used to uh, have the proper side distance requirement on the road. So to meet the side distance requirement of a road that road should be free of lateral obstructions lateral obstructions means the obstruction at the outside edge of the curve where it will be where that object will be uh, 
disturbing the side distance of the vehicles. So these obstructions may be man-made structures or natural obstructions. So when you are traveling on a curve, if you have a house inside edge of the closer to the inside edge of the road, you cannot see the other part of the curve because of the house. So it obstructs the side distance. On the other hand, if there is a larger rock closer to the inside edge of the road, still that will be disturbing your side distance. So these obstructions would be placed in a distance where this, the side distance is not obstructed. So if, if they cannot be uh, removed or if there is a natural obstruction, sometimes we may not be able to move that obstruction. So in that case, we have to redesign or move our horizontal alignment so that it will not be an obstruction to sight. So we have to think about that. Uh, when you are designing if the lateral clearance are not there. So in here we will be looking at a situation we obstruct the side distance. So in this top one you have set of shops or a, a, a merchant area where the side distance will be obstruct inside the curve. Here this is a straight section then you are getting a curve here this is a straight section same section without these obstructions we will see how the things happening in both these scenarios you have the center line of the road here this is the center line of the lane this will be the lane and this is the center line of the lane and this will be the hard shoulder this is somewhere outside the hard shoulder so we will be looking at what is happening in this two cases simultaneously so you can see in both cases the vehicle is running so this is seen as a driver eye height view so you can see what is happening here at the bottom image you can see once the obstructed obstruction is seen the vehicle is stopped if you uh, can remember this stopped first and this stopped second that means this vehicle was seen later than this one so that means this is obstructed by these uh, objects so the side view is obstructed by these object, objects so if you view that again you will see it So they, they are started at same time. This when the obstruct when the vehicle coming from the other side is seen, this vehicle has traveled 17 seconds. You can see it here. And this vehicle has only traveled 13 seconds. So that vehicle sees the object four seconds earlier than the first one. That because that is because of these obstructions. In this case, you don't have any obstructions. So you will see the objects closer to the inside of the road will be disturbing the side distance. So these objects have to be placed outside the travel, outside the uh, lane edge or the outside edge of the road, but it would be at some distance where it will not be uh, disturbing the side distance. In this equation, we will be looking at how to uh, check the lateral offset for uh, road curves. Here you have the traveling vehicle. This is the center of the uh, traveling path of that vehicle. This is the obstruction. This would be the line of sight offset. So that one is given as O, this length. So this O equals R into 1 minus cos 28.65 S over R 
where s would be the stopping side distance and uh, stopping side distance or side distance and r would be the radius of the curve in the inside plane so that r is not the radius of the road curve but it will be the radius in meters at the center of the inside lane so this cos value 28.65 into s over r so this cos value should be can calculated in degrees uh, when you are applying the equation then this equation is developed only for the situation we are side distance is greater than or less side distance is less than or equal to length of the curve so your side distance would be something like this your curve length would be greater than this side distance so if if it is at the other case or the side distance is greater than the length of the curve you have to graphically analyze this situation to find out the uh, lateral offset need to be uh, considered in the road curves so one more thing this equation is developed using post road guidelines but in rda guidelines also we have a similar equation but kind of difference than this one uh, but it gives the same values but the equation is equation is different slightly uh since this one is a more uh, easy equation than the rda guideline i have shown it here so you can directly calculate the lateral offset needed for a uh, vehicle traveling inside of the curve so that the obstructions will not be a problem to the side distance of that vehicle uh, same thing can be obtain from this curve also so that is about the lateral offset required for the horizontal curves inside road inside the roads so in this session we have looked at curve widening of roads and lateral offset of the curves uh, in the next session we will be looking at vertical alignment of the road In this video, we are going to look at vertical alignment. Vertical alignment is the elevation component of a road where you are study about the elevation or otherwise the gradient and vertical curves of a road. So, in vertical alignment, we have two elements, the straight section, that means the tangent section. Straight means the grade gradient section and the vertical curve we have crest, crest curves and sag curves so a curve like this would be called as a crest curve so all these are crest curves and this kind of curves are called sag curves so in terms of the gradient of the vertical alignment so up to three percent of uh, gradient you will be traveling without uh, much problem when uh, traveling without much problem we especially mean the design vehicle that should be usually if it is a heavy vehicle such as a truck so in uh, vertical alignment we call it about three percent gradient the heavy vehicles are not suffering when it is traveling so when the uh, gradients up to six percent there may be not much of a problem but when you have gradients higher than ten percent they are maybe uh, they may be finding hard to uh, travel on those roads so if you can uh, remember where we travel from kurunagal to candy uh, around galagajara we have a very uh, sharp gradient area so the steep slope in the roads are present so you can usually see these uh, heavy vehicles trucks are
traveling slow in this area so that is what happens when you have high gradients in roads so the general maximum gradients according to RDA design guidelines are given in this table so they are given in terms of the class of the road so you have A class, B class, C and D, C, D and E so this F means the flat terrain a flat terrain means a terrain kind of level area the topography of the area is a level so R means the rolling terrain in that terrain you have the level condition as well as some uh, gradient so some uh, mountainous conditions and if you then you call it when we come to a mountainous terrain for M you have a mountain road so you have high gradients at uh, frequent intervals so for a class road if it is a flat grade flat, flat terrain you can use up to 4% of uh, gradient for vertical uh, alignment design for rolling terrain you can go up to 6% and for uh, mountainous terrain you can go up to 8% so a code, uh, when the level of the road coming low, lower like B, C, D and E you can go up to a uh, higher gradient of the road so then we talked about the minimum gradient because you have a maximum gradient so the you cannot have a level ground without zero with zero percent gradient so you cannot have a flat road because it is not uh, good for drainage so water coming onto the road it will not pass through on the longitudinal section of the road on the cross section side of the road it, the water on the road would be passed through the super elevation but if you consider about the longitudinal distance it won't be uh, draining off because if you have a level uh, ground or as the road so in that case we are using 0.3% uh, gradient in urban areas and 0.5% gradient in uh, rural areas but in, the, in some flat areas you can use uh, flat roads for smaller lengths uh, without adhering to this 0.3% you can use a uh, small lengths of flat gradient that means 0% uh, gradient so then we will be looking at something called critical length of gradient so when you have a gradient road so like here you have a gradient road so if this gradient is too much that means the length of this gradient is too much heavy vehicles is experiencing very hard travel so it will hard for the vehicles to heavy vehicles to travel in this area so because of that we are specifying maximum critic maximum length we are you have to go with certain gradient so for 30 per 3 percent gradient we have to go for a maximum length of 480 so this tangent length would be less than 480 this gradient length should be less than 480 uh, when you are designing so when it comes to 480 you have to have a vertical curve and ease the gradient and you again you can uh, increase the gradient if you want after the vertical curve that means uh, when you have a vertical curve you will be having a uh, lesser gradient than the first gradient so that will make the uh, travel of the vehicle more easier so according to the gradient you have certain critical lengths you can see when the gradient is too high this critical lengths become very low so this chart also gives a way to calculate the uh, can I obtain the critical length according to the uh, gradient of the road and it, uh, also it has the uh, speed of the vehicle also that means the speed reduction how much speed reduction uh, the vehicle will occur when it is traveling on a uh, gradient section then you have the vertical curves so to know about the gradient this thing 
so to connect the gradients these two gradients we have vertical curves they are called vertical curves so you can have this type of crest curve otherwise you can have this type of sag curves so in these crest curves we are uh, dealing with the stopping or passing side distance and comfort and appearance control we will be talking that in a later slide so in the sag curves if you can remember under uh, side distance lesson we learned about headlight side distance so in sag curves mainly we are looking at headline side distance and stopping side distance uh, apart from the appearance comfort and especially the drainage criteria because at a sag curve like this you have a sag curve so in the center of the sag curve you the water will be collected because of the shape so we have to uh, have more attention about the drainage part in that sag curves so when you are talking about vertical curves there is a term called k where the curvature is defined the term k or the coefficient of vertical curves equals to length of vertical curve over a a means the algebraic difference between the grades so this a means g1 minus g2 and you have to get the mod of that value without the plus or minus sign so this k value equals l over a so the curvature is given by uh, length over a value so if you uh, define if you uh, check this equation uh, closely you can see this k means the length of vertical curve to have 1% gradient change that is the uh, definition of k so then we will be looking at what are the k values for designing each type of horizontal curves so sorry vertical curves so first we will be looking at crest curves i told you here the curvature is given by a value k so everything will be uh, defined in terms of k in uh, vertical curves sometimes we, we define the things with length of the curve but most of the time we define the vertical curves in terms of k value so in this table you have the uh, stopping side distance continuation side distance and overtaking side distance we are at the crest curve how much of uh, k value you need for a vertical curve so if you can remember in the side distance lesson there are a vehicle is coming on this side and there is an object on this side so we are calculating the side distance so that side distance should be seen along this vertical curve so that should be provided by this curvature otherwise it could be blocked by this curvature so uh, what we are doing is we are providing that curvature to the road to have that satisfactory side distance so here for design speed of 30 you have to have 2.1 k value of your the vertical curve should have a k value this crest vertical curve should have a k value of 2.5 2.1 to have satisfactory stopping side distance so when the speed is increasing you can see the k value is also increasing so in this uh, calculations when, when you are getting this length we are considering h1 as the drive eye height which is 1.05 and h2 as the object cutoff height which is 1.2 so there are two occasions where uh, side distance can be considered along with the uh, vertical curve length that is length of vertical curve where side distance is greater than length of vertical curve and the other one is length of vertical curve where side distance is uh, less than the length of vertical curve but when you have when we do the calculations we can prove that this length of vertical curve where side distance is less than the length of vertical curve that means if the side distance is 30 and length of vertical curve would be 
35 40 so in, in these situations uh, we are only calculating these things that means uh, where your side distance is greater than length of vertical curve we are not considering this because this LV is greater than this LV so we always consider in calculations our length of vertical curve is greater than the side distance then you have the crest curve criteria for appearance so appearance criteria we are considering a curve length instead of a k value so if you have a very shorter vertical curve it is not it is not giving good appearance very shorter vertical curves will not be giving good appearance so to give good appearance you should have kind of three seconds travel time uh, for the vertical curve so if the design speed is 30 your vertical curve looks curve length for uh, crest curves it should be at least 30 so gain for 40 it should be uh, 40 uh, for appearance criteria this can be used in sec curves also uh, otherwise because this appearance criteria would be catering uh, crest and sec both but it is defined for crest curves this uh, 30 you have 30 meter uh, length of vertical curve for if it is the design speed of 60 for design speed of 60 you can have to have 50 meter length so sometimes if the gradient change so this gradient change is very low if this gradient change is very low you can avoid a vertical curve so for design speed of 30 if the gradient change is less than 1.3 you can avoid a vertical curve and only retain the two uh, tangent section so if you can uh, if you can uh, consider a situation where yeah, you have a one percent upgrade and uh, again it is upgrading at a nine percent radiant so the percentage change is 0.1 percent so in that case for a design speed of 30 you can have 1.3 uh, or less uh, sorry so if since this gradient change is 0.1%, it is less than 1.3. If the uh, design speed is 30 or even up to uh, 100 meter gradient, 100 meter design speed, you can have that curve section without a vertical curve. So sometimes you may uh, encounter this kind of situations where the gradient change is less than the, these values. So you can design the curve uh, design the road without a vertical curve so then we are considering about something called the crest curves with comfort criteria sometimes when you are traveling on a road you might feel that you are at a, uh, at some vertical curves you might feel that you are uh, going like over the top of the road or you are feeling like it's very hard to travel in that road due to the speed so that means the comfort criteria of that vertical curves are not there so we have to have the vertical curves to satisfy the comfort criteria also so in that case the k value should be 2.4 for design speed of 30 kilometers per hour and uh, 4.2 for design speed of 40 kilometers per hour so if you consider about example uh, if this gradient changes if in a curve, vertical curve if the gradient changes uh, 3% if the gradient changes 3% so then this value should be multiplied by 3 because this is the value for 1% gradient change if it is 3% uh, gradient change you have to multiply by this multiply this 4.2 by 
three percent three. That means uh, about twelve point six. So you have to use the vertical curve of curve length of twelve point six or higher. But uh, if you consider about forty and if this is 12.6 but for the appearance criteria you have to use vertical curve length of 40 so you have to consider all these facts when selecting the vertical curve lens then you are we are going to the sag curves in sag curves we are specially dealing with the headlight side distance so because due to, uh, in terms of the headlight criteria the k values of the sag curves would be uh, for 30 kilometers per hour it should be 4 and 40 kilometers per hour it should be 7.3 like that so then you have something called uh, design criteria for sag curves for overhead obstructions so under side distance criteria we could uh, learn about the overhead obstructions especially for sag curves when we have underneath road and we have overhead obstruction so we have to check the vertical clearance properly uh, and uh, actually when, when you have overhead, overhead obstruction you have to uh, make sure this obstruction will not obstruct the sight line when the vehicles are coming at the top of the road so this can be calculated using this equation this length of vertical curve to satisfy this criteria so that this uh, vehicle is this side distance is not blocked by the overhead obstruction this is given by this uh, equation where you have the uh, sg is the height of obstruction from this pavement surface and h1 would be the driver height and h2 would be the object cutoff height so this is about the vertical alignment design in uh, road uh, highway design so when you are designing vertical curves and gradients you have to uh, think of these factors so in actual terms these are derived with so many equations i haven't uh, put these equations in here because of the uh, time constraints but when you are going to a job or when you are reading more about these things you will come across come across so many equation derivations so the view will be seeing how these equations are derived from uh, basic principles but uh, in, at the moment i am giving you the uh, equations how to calculate these things uh, and how to apply these things into a real design world so at the civil 3d class we will be looking at how to uh, apply these things in real world uh, alignment design uh, in the next class we will be looking at the mm, horizontal and vertical uh, alignment coordination we are we have we are when designing roads yeah, we need to consider the horizontal alignment and vertical alignment uh, both together to get a very much desirable road for much safety and efficient driving. So in that section we will be learning how to uh, combine uh, horizontal alignment and vertical alignment together to have a better road so after that we will be looking at the civil 3d class where you can design your own roads with horizontal and vertical alignments in this video we are going to learn about horizontal and vertical coordination of uh, geometric design uh, so far we have learned up to seven steps from an introduction to vertical alignment so this will be the final step of uh, geometric design we learn 
that is horizontal and vertical coordination so when you are designing these theories and all those things are derived from research and empirical formulas and by uh, engineering theories but when you are applying this to an actual roadway you have to think beyond the theory and research or empirical formulas and apply what is suitable for the scenario so otherwise you won't be having an efficient or smooth flowing roads or highways to do that we have general controls for horizontal alignment vertical alignment as well as both horizontal and vertical alignment in this section we are looking at the general controls for horizontal alignment one thing we have to consider is your alignment for the road should follow the natural terrain as far as possible in this left side image you can see this is a hilly road but the road is coming on the contour so it is uh, following the natural terrain then we have to avoid as much as shorter curves you know we should not use shorter curves in designing the horizontal alignment shorter curves makes un driving uncomfortable here in this right side uh, image you can see there is a very short curve a sharp short curve so the drivers would not be uh, would not feel comfortable when driving these short curves so we have to avoid them as much as possible then when you are designing you might remember in the uh, super elevation uh, lecture we have learned the minimum radius for a curve according to the design speed so there were there were tables according to uh, various design speed how much of radius we have to use according to super elevation for example if you are designing a curve to a uh, 30 meter design 30 kilometers per hour design speed so to have super elevation of 2.5 you should have minimum radius of 35 that does not mean you should always use 35 meter you have to use higher super higher radius as much as possible if there is room or space if there if there is space for design so in that uh, location instead of a 35 meter radius curve if you can have 50 meter radius curve you have to put that radius because that may be that makes the driver more comfortable in driving in that section so you have to use uh desirable radius instead of the uh, minimum radius the absolute minimum radius you have to use a desirable radius which is larger than the uh, minimum radius then you have to avoid sharp curves at the end of long straight section in this top image you may see this is a long straight section all of a sudden you will be coming on a sharp curve so this kind of curves might be very dangerous in the night time because when the vehicle comes from this side he may not uh, see the curve at once so accidents may be very frequent at at this type of location so you have to avoid them as much as possible then you have to use the use a sufficient horizontal curve length to avoid the uh, view of a kink so it says you have to at least use 3v for your horizontal curve length 3v means if your design speed is uh, 100 km per hour so your uh, curve length should be at least 300 meters like that so that is how to use the 
curve length but that should be the least value the desirable value would be 6v so if you uh, so if your design speed is 100 km per hour your desirable curve length would be 6v that should be 600 meters so if you have shorter curve lengths you may can see this is a very unpleasant uh, view of the road we call it a kink so to avoid the uh, shorter horizontal curves we have to uh, use sufficient length of curve then when using compound curves that means curves which going on the same direction without a tangent so when you are using that kind of curve the radius ratio should be r1 equals 1.5 r2 that means the larger radius should curve should be equal or less than 1.5 times the sharper radius curve then you have to avoid broken back curves as much as possible broken back curves means two curves rotating in the same direction with a small short tangent or small straight section in between so we have to avoid that uh, broken back curves as much as possible because when there's a straight section after the curve driver feels that there's a straight portion so in that straight portion he might increase the speed but all of a sudden he will come across another curve so that might be undesirable for the uh, driver or he might uh, face unexpected conditions due to this uh, curve behavior then we will be looking at the general controls for horizontal vertical curves vertical alignment actually so as i said earlier the gradients and the vertical curve should used, be used to fit the natural terrain but in doing so you should not uh, make the road with the roller coaster effect so in this case you can see this road is looking like following the natural terrain but this is kind of a roller coaster road so you can if you are here you might see might see you may not see a vehicle coming in this sag curve so this is called the roller coaster effect so you have to avoid that effect when designing the road when you are following the natural terrain so instead of that you have to use suitable method to avoid that effect and follow the natural terrain then sag vertical curves should be avoided in cut sections if you can remember a sag vertical curve which is a curve like this so in sag vertical curves the water is collected at the center so if you have a cut section that means the road is going through a mountain or we have to cut the road to you have to cut the existing ground to, ground to create the new road so in that sense there will be a boat there will be a section we are the water is collecting at the center of the curve since there is a cut section you you have to uh, put more effort to uh, remove the water out of the cut section because if there is a fill section water will automatically drain out through the fill section because road is at a higher level and the natural ground is at a lower level but in a cut section what would happen is the road is at a lower level then then the natural ground is at a higher level so it is hard to drain out the water so you have to avoid sag vertical curves in cut sections then two vertical curves in same direction separated by a short tangent which is called broken back grade line should be avoided especially sag curves due to aesthetic conditions so I think you could understand this thing. So, two vertical curves separate by, by a short tangent. So, I explained the be behavior in the uh, horizontal alignment, which is 
meant by the broken back horizontal curve so same thing happens here broken back great lines you have two vertical curves with a short tangent in between especially in sec sections it will be very uh, hard or it will be very unpleasant uh, view due to this uh, broken back great line effect so then we will be looking at the combination of this horizontal and vertical alignment initially in the initial part of this lecture we thought we looked about the horizontal and vertical control uh, by individual sense horizontal only and vertical only but in this now we are looking at both of them together so how can we use both horizontal and vertical alignment together to have a better driving comfortable and better safety and better growth in our design perspective so astro green book 2018 gives some ex examples of horizontal and vertical this h a and g a means horizontal alignment and vertical alignment coordination in design astro green book means that is a design guideline used or developed in uh, USA so this is this 2018 version is the most recent version it gives some examples of horizontal and vertical alignment coordination so you have uh, other versions of this book also it at those this at those books also we have the same examples so these are some of the examples you have to follow in horizontal and vertical alignment to have a better coordination so in this uh, you have to note that in america the driving direction is opposite from ours so they are driving this way on the left side of the road and this way on the right side of the road so in sri lanka we are going the other way apart from that uh, we have all those things have to be followed as it is when you are designing so if you have a straight section here what it described is you should not have a crest curve and a sag curve like this when you are designing instead you can have a straight tangent section in the profile also in your plan or in the horizontal alignment if you have a tangent section you can have a, a tangent section in vertical profile also here it says if you have a curve you should not have bumps in your profile like crest sag crest so you should not use this kind of behavior on your profile if you have a plan curve on your horizontal alignment so if your uh, horizontal alignment is a curve your vertical alignment should not be like this instead you can have the vertical profile some kind of a grid then you have this thing you have a curve here and you have a straight here in your horizontal alignment here you have in the profile you have a lower ground here and a high ground here so <coughs> if you have vertical curves like this in as this in the initial example like this so the vehicles coming from this side according to this image the vehicles are coming from this side so it will make an unpleasant bumps on the road if you design the profile like this so instead you can have single grade here you have a short tangent in between the uh, horizontal curves this is a reverse curve separate by a short tangent so this is called this is not desirable for two reasons that is this tangent is too short and this reverse curve occurs on a crest so this crest the crest is the top point so at the top point the gradient is very low it is close to zero here the gradient is somewhat higher this side also somewhat higher here the gradient is very low so it is there is a tendency to 
collect water at this point and if you have a reverse curve there will be a level crown area you call it where there will be a level road because this due to this curve the super elevation across or the water flows this side according to this super elevation according to this curve water flows this side so the road is turning this side here and turning this side here so this road have to rotate to the other side in this area so in this area you may have a lower gradient road or lower super elevation road especially you will have a zero super elevation here so here you have the zero super elevation you have the zero gradient so there is a very high tendency to collect water in this area so accident may be very frequent in this areas if you design the horizontal alignment and vertical alignment like this then also we have another scenario where you have a shorter sag curve smaller sag curve with a sharp horizontal curve so we, this arrangement make this the make this horizontal curve more sharper so instead you can have a crest curve with a long curve with a long crest curve also you can have long sag curve as well both these are okay without this one which is has a sharper curve and a smaller very uh, uh, shorter sag curve the length of the curve is very low so there are some other scenarios also you can uh, watch them you can see them and learn them uh, by yourself uh, if, uh, then i will be showing you a small video of what we have discussed so far that's about horizontal and vertical coordination in geometric design of highways uh, with that we will be concluding the theory part of uh, geometric design in highway engineering uh, these are the references i have used in my lecture throughout my lecture series so so far we have learned lot of things and there are a lot more to be studied by yourself because depending on the uh, time schedule i cannot teach everything related to geometric design but i have given one of the most important uh, components in geometric design so that you can follow geometric designs after you go to the industry so i hope you will you have a good uh, good knowledge using this uh, lecture series and i wish you will ask questions and ask for clarification through the uh, forum i have created in uh, fields again if you have uh, problems i will be conducting a zoom lecture session or zoom discussion session in the coming weeks so you can ask your questions for clarifications so i can explain them more to you so that you can understand them very clearly and then in the coming weeks we will be starting the civil 3d uh, design software so with civil 3d you can learn more and you can practice this uh, learn theories and learned uh, geometric design components using real world examples so that will be in the coming weeks uh, so before starting civil 3d i hope you can uh, ask me any questions for clarifications or anything you need to know about this geometric design through the uh, forum i have created for you or otherwise in the zoom uh, discussion session which i will be informed you in a uh, later day 
what is the exact date and time so until then uh, thank you for all i hope you got uh, many things from this lecture series and we will be meeting in the civil 3d session afterwards